This is Sean Kelly. I'm here at Santa Barbara City College, and we are about to begin our exam three coverage. Exam three will be next Monday. And this is a review of the material in chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, and 14. that will be on the end. Okay. So in just a moment, we'll begin our review. Let's get our link for those people at home. If you're joining us at home, please feel free to write in your questions. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's see. Give me one second. We'll be starting in just a moment. In the meantime, look at our blank screen. Okay, announcements. Oh, that's what I had to do, just press enter. Okay, wow, can't believe that. There we go. All right. <laughs> So, uh, you guys that are here, I'm actually interested to know what what would you prefer as far as the review order. I can. See, we haven't completed chapter 13, and we still have chapter 14. I have tomorrow. Would you like me to begin at the beginning? Or review? We'll review, and then we'll continue, and I'll be kind of teaching you for the first time in an abbreviated fashion. Obviously, I can't cover it in detail like I can in a lecture. But you'll be hearing, I'll, hear you, I'll try to share with you the key ideas from chapter 13 and 14 that we haven't yet covered. Okay, so we'll start with what I'm sorry. Could you run to the bathroom so that you get a chance to go? <laughs> Thank you. 
Which one? I might know this. Because I, I have to, I, I went through that. Just through my mom. Is it in the news? Because I know exactly what happened if that's the case. All right, you ready to get started? Okay, so number one uh, is a little bit of material from the um, from the solar system, the Kuiper Belt. And so we have a term called the Kuiper Belt object. What is the Kuiper Belt object? An object found in the Kuiper Belt. Okay, what are they made of? What are they made of? Mostly made of what? Different kinds of ices, right? And, and actually many types of ices, not just water ice. We have nitrogen ice, methane ice, oxygen ice, ammonia ice, different kinds of ice. Uh, they're found outside of the orbit of Neptune, Kuiper Belt, okay? Uh, describe some of the major discoveries uh, made by New Horizons when it flew past Pluto. It discovered that Pluto is alive. It's got some interesting things going on. There are hardly any craters, which means the surface is fresh and new. It has a giant glacier made of nitrogen ice. It has mountains made of water ice. It has uh, so many interesting features. We can't even explain them all. It's got plains and mountains and dunes and, and, and really interesting things. It has an atmosphere mostly made of nitrogen, but it also has some organic compounds in them. These organic compounds and the atmosphere itself, we think, get bigger and smaller depending on the location of Pluto. When Pluto is near the sun, the atmosphere is thicker and these compounds can be in the atmosphere. And then when it gets further away from the sun, they solidify on the surface of the planet. The red color is organic compounds that were probably once in the atmosphere. And that's about it. Well, that's not it. Okay. Pluto has a really big moon, Sharon. And Pluto and Sharon are tidally locked to each other. They're about the same. Uh, sorry, they're, they're similar masses. So Pluto is about how big? A couple thousand miles across. It's not very big. And then Sharon is about half the size. And so what that means is that they're small, they're comparable masses, they have tidally locked to each other. They orbit each other and constantly face the same face at each other. Okay, the other moons are, uh, there's five moons altogether. They have chaotic orbits. That would be an interesting thing. Which means even though we know roughly where they are, we don't know exactly where they're going to be in the future. They're, they're continuing to interact with one another and they make that makes their orbits unpredictable. Okay, so jumping down now, that was it. That's it, okay? The largest moon is Sharon. Uh, jumping down, we have from chapter 10, talking about the star. I played a video for you and believe it or not, you might have a question related to the band They Might Be Giants, okay? They had an old song, they copied from the, the world that said the sun is a mass, of incandescent gas, but it's not. What is the right thing? Wow. It's made of plasma. The sun is electrically charged. All of the atoms have been ripped apart, and you have ions and electrons mixed up to make a plasma. Thermonuclear fusion refers to what's happening in the core of the sun. What is thermonuclear fusion? Hot plasma particles smash together, and then if they get close enough together, they can merge into one new nucleus. Why is this important? Because it releases energy and powers the stars, right? So when we have nuclear fusion of a main sequence star, let me use that language, right? A main sequence star is using what fuel to turn into what ash? Hydrogen fuel turns into helium ash. I'm using the words that you should know. It takes four hydrogen nuclei to make one helium nucleus. And if you weigh the two together, which one weighs more, the hydrogen or the helium? Hydrogen weighs more. There's a little bit of matter that is converted into pure energy. That's the power of the star. Okay, hydrostatic equilibrium is two forces are balanced inside of a living star. What are the two forces? One of them is the inward force, which we call pulling everything together, the force that's organizing everything, gravity. And what is working against the gravity? 
radiation pressure, right? Where is the radiation pressure generated? The energy in the core pushes out in the radiative zone, but it can't escape, right? And that, that fact that it can't escape very easily is what's generating this pressure that holds up the star, keeps it, keeps it from collapsing. Differential rotation refers to the fact that the sun is a big mass of not solid, but plasma, and it rotates at different rates. Where does it rotate the fastest? At the equator, right? About 25 days, and at the pole, the slowest, about 35 days or 34, depending on the Okay, not a huge thing. Okay, so we got the core. Why is the core the place where the energy is being generated? Or where is the core where the fusion is taking place? Because it is hot, dense, high pressure, right? All of the factors that you need to make the fusion happen. The core is where it's hot enough for nuclear fusion to take place. It's not happening anywhere else. Only in the core is it hot enough to have a nuclear fusion. The radiative zone, is outside the core and the light is trying to escape, what kind of light is generated in the nuclear fusion process? And you should know that the answer is gamma rays, right? Very high energy, really high energy photons are produced. If they were to come and hit the earth, what would happen? We would have a bad day, right? It would be destructive. It's so powerful, this radiation, it would cause damage. But luckily it can't escape. It gets absorbed and recreated and when it finally gets out of the sun, it's in the form of visible light mostly, and also a little bit of ultraviolet and a little bit of infrared, right? The solar radiation that gets out is much lower energy. So that's a good thing. The convective zone is outside the radiative zone. What's happening there? Convection is happening there, right? Convection means the flow of matter, which carries the heat energy from inside towards the outside. And so the material that carries the energy is called the convective fluid. The convective fluid in this case is just the outer layer of material, which is probably mostly hydrogen, right? Hydrogen is leaving uh, convective zone. How do we see the convection? Well, we only see the very top, uh, top of the convective layer, and those are called granulations. We'll be coming back to that in a minute, okay? So the granulations are a revelation of the interior uh, motion of material in a convective cycle, right? The photosphere is the, the top of that convective zone that we can see, it's where the light is coming from. Photosphere literally means light sphere. So it's the top of the convection zone that's radiating light according to black body radiation, right? So the temperature of the sun is what determines this uh, radiation. The chromosphere, is a part of the atmosphere of the sun, very close to the sun, the denser atmosphere. And the thing you're supposed to know is it has a color, what color? A pink color, right? That's light red, right? Why is it light red? Because there's bright white and then red, and so it looks like pink, okay? So pink color. Outside the chromosphere, we have a very low density, higher part of the atmosphere of the sun called the corona. What is the temperature of the corona? about a million Kelvin, really hot, but very low density, okay? So when do we see the corona? Significant. When can we see the corona of the sun? During a total solar eclipse, the light of the sun gets blocked and we can finally see these wispy layers. It was so beautiful when I saw it. I was like, wow, it's really impressive, okay? Strong nuclear force, we went back over it a couple of, uh, yesterday maybe, I guess I went back over it. Why is a strong nuclear force important? What's the job? What, what does it do? It's stronger than what force? Stronger than gravity, of course, because gravity is weak, and stronger than the electromagnetic force. Okay, so what do protons want to do? What do protons have to do in order to undergo nuclear fusion? They don't want to go together because they're both positive. They repel each other. In order to overcome that repulsion, what do you have to do? They have to move fast enough to slam together and then they can get really close together. It's only by getting really close together that the strong nuclear force can step in. The strong nuclear force is stronger than the repulsive force, but only acts on a really small range, like the size of a nucleus. So it only works if you can get them close enough together. It doesn't work when they're out here. 
only when they're very, very close together. But the strong nuclear force is the force that holds the nucleus together. And so during the nuclear fusion process, it steps in to let the hydrogen atoms or protons uh, to stick together. Proton-proton chain is a complicated thing, right? You don't have to know about everything, but what's the most important part? Proton-proton chain is important for smaller mass stars. We learned today less than 1.4 solar masses. That's going to be the dominant method by which energy is generated. And it works by taking individual protons and pushing them together with other protons. Okay, that's part of the process. How many protons go in? Four go in, and one nucleus of helium comes out. That's the proton proton. Also, you do get some other things. You get gamma rays, and you get something else. These little tiny, very low uh, mass particles that can pass through the entire Earth. They're called neutrinos. As part of the nuclear fusion process, neutrinos are produced as a byproduct. It's not the main product, right? A byproduct. So, um, what is antimatter? Antimatter is really strange, right? It is something weird. I don't know how do you describe antimatter. It's uh, interestingly enough, from energy, you can make matter appear, but if matter appears, antimatter has to appear in equal quantities. So, antimatter is like a, a version of, it's not matter, antimatter. Hmm, how do I describe it? I'm going to describe the antimatter. Can they have a good definition? I know what it is. But it's hard to describe it. What is it? It's weird. What is matter? Okay, well, matter. Oh, man. Uh, antimatter. I don't know. What do you need to know? What do you need to know? You need to know that if antimatter meets matter, something happens. What happens? They annihilate each other, right? They're gone. So out of nothing, out of energy, you can get equal amounts of matter and antimatter, or if equal amounts of matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate one another. So you should know the name of the antimatter electron. You should know that name right there. What is the name? It's called a positron. A positron is a positively charged particle with the same mass as an electron. Okay, so they're particles that have mass, but they have the opposite charge. So positive charge is positive instead of the electron's negative charge. And if an electron and a positron meet, what will happen? They will annihilate one another. They'll no longer be there. But the energy that they had, E equals mc squared, will be released, usually in the form of light. Okay? So, I don't know. so neutrino we mentioned is a very strange particle it's like a ghost particle it goes through things right in fact they go through the earth they're passing through us right now uh billions and billions of them i forgot the exact number it's huge okay but all the time these particles are passing through this are produced by the sun and they pass through um, the earth even what else um they escape from the sun without stopping unlike the photons that are trapped uh, and I forgot to say, how long do the photons take to get out of this, out of the sun? If you, if you consider the original photons created during the fusion process, how long do they take to escape, the energy of those photons take to escape? About 100,000 years to get out of the sun. It takes a really long time. Uh, okay, what else do you want about a, a neutrino? We have neutrino detectors deep underground. There are projects around the world, but they're deep underground. They're made of water or ice. And once in a while, a neutrino will hit a molecule of water or a molecule, well, molecule of water, right? Water, liquid water or solid water and make a little flash of light. Not very often, but in the past, we have seen a few. Okay, jumping to the next column, Maunder minimum. Solar oh, the, oh, solar granulation, sorry. Okay, what is that? That is a, a, a feature that we see on the surface of the sun. And uh, actually, I can do things like this. I can just bring up a picture, right? Quick picture. What's a granulation? Granulation. So you can all see it, right? What's important about a granulation, right? Is that, okay, don't look at that. Of the sun. Oh my gosh. So this is a picture right here. This is a picture which shows the granulation. You see little cells 
of granulation. Those are convective cells. The middle is brighter and the sides are darker. The middle is the hotter part and it's the rising gases coming out. But when they cool, they then fall around the edge of the granulation. So the rising material is hotter and brighter and the darker material is cooler and falling around the walls of the granulation. So this is the convective process on the sun. It looks a lot like boiling water because that's a simpler kind of look. You would see that with water that is boiling. Did you breathe anything? Granulation on the end. Not that remember those. Monitor minimum? Uh, what does that refer to? Sunspots. Okay, when you think of monitor minimum, you should think of sunspots. The sunspots come in cycles. So we have uh, periods of more sunspots, that's called solar max, and periods with less sunspots, solar minimum. Okay. Monitor minimum is the, a period of time um, between, and was it 15, for about 100 years actually, 14, no, 1550 to 1650, something like that, where there were no sunspots. So it was a period of time when we looked and saw no sunspots. Can we explain that? No, we cannot, but we noticed it. And it's not just that nobody was looking, people were actually trying to see them and they didn't see any sunspots. We do go through periods where there's no sunspots, right? But this was a very strange, long period of time. Can you know the date? Uh, I think I'm 1550 to 1650, I think is what they say, something like that. About 100 years. It may be a little less, a little more. It's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that it's a period of time when there were no sunspots. Not because we didn't see them, but because we, uh, yeah, that's true. Not because we didn't look, but because we looked and didn't see them, right? They were not there. What's a prominence? <clears throat> Again, I should show a picture. Maybe. A prominence uh, and a picture looks like an arc, right? It jumps from one. Uh, Okay, so prominence is, is part of a, a sunspot or uh, activity on the sun, which is magnetic. A solar prominence. Okay, there you go. Perfect picture of a prominence. It arcs from one side to another. What does this show us? This shows us the magnetic field lines of the sun. It's a magnetic phenomenon. We can't see magnetic field, but we can see the charged particles following the magnetic field line. This is plasma, and it's all energized and illuminated and shining with light that follows the magnetic field line. So the prominence is arcing from one side to the other. If it twists and pinches off, then a piece of this seems to escape from the sun, and we call it a flare, right? So a solar flare is a little bit different, right? So the solar flare is a pinched off version. Uh, okay, that's not a flare, that's a problem. This is a flare, kind of. Prominence, those are prominence. Prominence, these are flares. Oh my gosh. Well, that could be a flare. Let's see how long it is here. Oh, that's the picture. That's, that's NASA. Cool. NASA, I like you, NASA. So when the magnetic field wraps on itself, it can pinch off a segment, and that will just leave the sun. And so it'll look like one jet coming out of the sun. It doesn't come back to the sun again. So it's called a flare, a solar flare. So these are high energy energy a uh, high energy events where material and uh, light and, and energy is escaping from the sun. Energy and material is escaping from the sun. Solar coronal mass ejection is an enormous version of one of these. So coronal mass ejection. When we study the corona, what wavelength do we or what type of light do we tend to focus on? You guys might remember in the X-ray part of the spectrum we can clearly see the corona. It's very high temperature, so it emits X-ray. And when we look at the sun, we find from time to time that the corona develops holes in it. They're called coronal holes. And then we know it's a predictive thing. We, can, we know that something's going to happen. And from those holes, 
we will get these big bursts of magnetic energy, and they are called coronal mass ejections. These are more dangerous, and they lead to a huge flux of material going towards the Earth. If it hits the Earth, it can cause damage. And we mentioned that satellites will close their solar panels and turn away from the sun if there's a close pass, even if it's not direct. There have been very few direct impacts from coronal mass ejection. We heard about one, I told you the story about one from the 1850s. Uh, that was a big deal. If one hit the Earth today, we would probably know because we would lose part of our power grid. Okay, so that's something we should know. The heliosphere, what would that be? That's the region, the magnetic region near the sun, the heliosphere, where the magnetic field of the sun reaches. Heliopause is outside of that, where the sun's magnetic field is no longer uh, present. So it's kind of like just outside the heliosphere, uh, that heliopause. You may have something happening there, but it's not the magnetic field of the sun that's causing it. Okay, be able to describe the layers of the sun and the heat energy and how the heat energy is transported in that layer. So the names kind of tell you the right answer. So in the core, you're producing the heat energy, and then it's trying to get out. How does it get out? Well, first, first stage is the radiated zone. We have radiation attempting to get out, and it's getting reabsorbed and reabsorbed and readmitted. It doesn't get out very easily. It takes 100,000 years for that light to escape. But that's actually a good thing. It creates the radiation pressure. So the radiative zone is where we get the radiation pressure being generated. Above the radiation zone, a uh, radiative zone, is the convective zone. And the convective zone is where energy is it's more efficient to do convection than radiation. And so our sun looks like that. Uh, so and then so the answer is radiation in the radiative zone, convection in the convection zone. How about outside the sun? How does heat escape from the sun? By radiation again. Okay, that's how we get our light, right? The light. And the solar wind uh, is also another way that energy is okay. different. And CNO, right? So we just learned today about CNO. CNO is a more efficient catalytic process for doing nuclear fusion. It still uses hydrogen and still turns it into helium. Four hydrogen protons, four hydrogen nuclei, one helium nucleus comes out, right? Four go in, one comes out. Uh, it's the same process, but what happens is it's more efficient, so it, it happens in a faster way. So uh, why is it, what, what happens, which one of them happens in stars? That's a question you should know. Both of them, both of them happen. But in smaller mass stars, less than 1.4 solar masses, PP is the dominant method. Above 1.4, that's a larger mass star, CNO is more effective, right? It turns out to be the more uh, important way. Explain why elements below iron, Fe, element 26, release energy by nuclear fusion, and higher elements, uh, release energy by nuclear fission. So the concept that we're talking about is called the nuclear binding energy. And we discovered in a graph on the slide, maybe I should show you that, should I show you that? Can we look at the picture, remind you? And let's remind us, uh, it's called nuclear binding energy. Nucleus, nuclear, binding energy. Okay, here is a picture. Right? So, this is a nuclear binding energy graph, and what it shows is the amount of energy per nucleon. A nucleon is a particle found in the nucleus, either a proton or a neutron. So, what happens is that if you're low, the amount of energy per nucleon is small, and the higher you go, the higher the energy per nucleon. Something special is Fe is the one that's the highest. You can't get higher than that. And so, a a principle that we're trying to understand is that when atoms join together, we call that nuclear fusion, the new nucleus that forms has less mass than the original. And what it does is releases energy during that process. The new nucleus is more efficient, has a higher amount of energy per nucleon than the original two, uh, original nuclei did. So when you go, when you go up, you're creating something that's more efficient. Iron is somehow the most efficient atom. So everybody wants to be like iron. That's kind of the end of the story, right? So if you're a smaller element, 
how do you get to be like iron, which is element number 26? By building a bigger nucleus, which is by joining forces with another nucleus. That's called nuclear fusion. If you're a big nucleus like uranium, if you want to be like iron, you have to break apart into pieces. And breaking apart into pieces is called nuclear fission. So it means the splitting of the nucleus into smaller pieces. <clears throat> so smaller atoms join forces and fuse. Bigger atoms split apart and fission. Okay. But iron is somehow the most efficient or the most effective uh, use of the energy. Okay, that's that's going to be important, especially for tomorrow when we talk about the end of the life of a star. Okay. Explain how at each stage of life. A star establishes hydrostatic equilibrium. Um, that's not really a, a great statement, but whatever. Um, in order to be alive, what is what is the star doing? Well, it's living. It hasn't collapsed, right? In order to not collapse, a star has to do what? It has to be in hydrostatic equilibrium. There's a force of gravity. When does gravity stop? That's a joke, right? Gravity never stops. Gravity is constantly going to pull. Who will win in the end? Gravity will win at the end, right? We're going to run out of fuel. Gravity's going to win. But as long as the star is alive, gravity's pulling in, and it's pushing back against gravity. And that force of pushing back is called radiation pressure. So hydrostatic equilibrium says that the star is alive because it can push back harder, softer, or the same as the force of gravity. Okay. The same. It balances the force of gravity. That's the hydrostatic equilibrium. Okay, so what happens when a particle meets antimatter? A particle of matter meets antimatter. For example, an electron and positron. We already mentioned what happens. They annihilate one another. So they're gone. The matter is gone. It's turned into pure energy, probably photons. Okay. Question? It's good? Okay. Uh, describe the convective flow in a single granule. I kind of did that already, right? Where does how does it work? The brighter center is the rising hot gases. The cooler edges are the descending uh, dark edges, right? The descending part. Okay, so rising, carrying energy up, descending, going back, and then it'll come back up again, right? It's a cycle of the granule. Explain how a sunspot forms and dis disappears. This is actually really fun, right? How does a sunspot form? We think that the process involves the magnetic field of the sun, right? So the sun's magnetic field is very smooth, but then it gets twisted up and eventually bunches up and pokes outside of the surface of the sun. And that's when a sunspot forms, right? So uh, everybody remember sunspots form in pairs. They have polarity. There's a north one and a south one. North polarity and south polarity, right? So what is it? What happens? Is it gonna, you can get a prominence between them and things like that. But why does the sunspot form? What is happening with the sunspot? Actually, we're going to get to this next question. How is the sunspot cooler? It's kind of part of the answer. How does it form? Why is it cooler? And the answer has to do with pressure. So just a, a quick reminder of how that works. There are two kinds of pressure in this problem. I'm just going to shoot over here. There are two kinds of pressure. When the sunspot forms, the two kinds of pressures are thermal pressure and magnetic pressure. So the sunspot initially is very small, but the magnetic field appears and adds a new, it makes a new contribution that wasn't there before. So we have the inside and we have the outside. We have a temperature inside the spot and a temperature outside the spot. We have a pressure inside the spot, which is based on that temperature. That will be thermal pressure. So we have a pressure inside the spot, and when the when the spot is first formed, before the magnetic field comes actually, the pressure here should match the pressure here. So they're equal. But when the magnetic field comes, it adds a new kind of pressure. Let me put magnetic pressure on this side. And now this is no longer equal, it's bigger. So because the internal pressure is bigger, now that I have the additional contribution, the spot is going to grow in size, right? And because it's growing in size, what's going to happen to the expanding gases? They're going to get 
cooler. So the sunspot gets cooler as the spot expands. So that's a good thing because, because the pressure here is going to go down, right? So we still have the magnetic pressure, but what's going to happen is this is going to reduce the internal pressure because the temperature will get lower. And when we add the new internal pressure, which is now lower than it was before, they will balance. It'll achieve equilibrium. And as long as the magnetic field is there to help balance, it's going to be fine. But at some point, the magnetic field is going to go away. And so these will no longer be balanced again. What happens when the magnetic field uh, goes away is the outside pressure is going to be larger than the inside pressure. It's going to collapse the spot. It will go away. And it will just be gone. Okay, so sunspot forms when the magnetic field is there to add pressure. And it goes away when you take away that magnetic field pressure. Oh, I couldn't see the whole thing. Oh, well. For you at home, you should be here. Okay. <laughs> that didn't work. Nobody's on. Oh, wait, somebody's on. No, no, just me. Nobody's on. No, no thumbs up. Not very popular. I failed as a YouTuber. Okay. All right. Okay, so I kind of also alluded to this, right? The sunspot. Magnetic field, uh, sorry, the sun, the sun's magnetic field is tied intimately to the plasma of the sun. Because of what we think that the magnetic field gets tangled. Differential rotation, right? Where is it rotating fastest? At the equator. And so it kind of winds itself up and eventually tangles up and, and bunches up and, and sticks outside. And then it goes back to being smooth again, right? So we go through periods where it's bunched up and then periods when it's smooth. When it's bunched up, you get a lot of sunspots, solar max. When it's smooth, it's solar minimum. There's no sunspots. Uh, describe how, did I describe it enough for you? Don't, it's not that complicated. So it pokes out, you get a sunspot. Doesn't poke out, no sunspot, okay? Smooth, no sunspot. Tangled, twisted, sunspots, okay? Describe how the solar magnetic field and pole reversal is related to sunspot activity. Okay, so actually it turns out the sunspot reverses polarity in the middle of the solar max, which is kind of weird, but that's what it does. And then it gets smooth again, and it, and it stops being, uh, there's no sunspot. So, but the, the magnetic field reverses ever, every 11 years. And the sunspot cycle also takes 11 years. So there's two different cycles you have to be aware of. The sunspot activity cycle, is an 11 year cycle. So high uh, sunspot activity, solar max, low, and then back to solar max again. That's 11 years between those peaks. Okay? But in that time of 11 years, the sun's polarity flips. So when we describe the magnetic cycle, I guess it's down here that I'm talking about that. Uh, the magnetic cycle is actually 22 years. So then if you went, you started at a north pole of high activity, you reduced to low activity, you're back to high activity, but that's now a south pole. Okay, so you got to go down to low activity, to back up, and then it's back to a north pole. We've gone through one complete magnetic cycle. Stages of the sun's life. Uh, we've now completed the discussion, or at least mentioned all of them, right? The protostar. I didn't talk about that very much, but what is that? Protostar is very long or not very long? Relatively speaking, not so long, right? It might be a million years. I don't even think it's a billion years, okay? The main sequence life, how long is that? We talked about specific numbers today. 10 billion years. Red giant stage, 1 billion years. White dwarf stage, long. Yeah, maybe a trillion years, right? So which one is the longest? White dwarf. Which one's the shortest? Protostar, right? So the time of formation is pretty quick, relatively speaking, okay? Uh, rotation of the sun, we already mentioned. 25 days in the equator. 34, 35 of the pole. Uh, the length of time a photon takes to escape, we said, was 100,000 years. Okay, so we got that. Moving right along. All right, sure. Just clicking right through here. All right, let's see if we change the page. Oh, probably not do this. That's what we got. Got to do what you got to do. Okay, chapter 11 the magnitude scale. All right, so magnitude scale refers to stars. And there's two kinds of magnitude scale. One is called the apparent visual magnitude, little m. What is that? Yeah. It's the brightness of a star seen from Earth, right? And we, we kept the convention 
that the magnitude scale, uh, there's a number that you and I can see with our eye without any help. The highest number we can see is a, a six, right? So magnitude six star is the dimmest star that we can see without seeing color. Uh, the strange thing about magnitude scale, that the higher you go, the dimmer the object. The lower you go, the brighter the object, and you can have negative numbers, right? So uh, we mentioned numbers like the, the moon, negative 12 and a half, the sun, negative 27, okay? Uh, so you can have very negative numbers. <clears throat> Apparent visual magnitude, oh, that's what I'm talking about. So magnitude in general is a very funny thing. It's a scale that's reversed from what I would typically do. Uh, so again, the lower you go, the brighter the object. And what's an absolute magnitude? You move the object to 10 parsecs, or 33, 32.6 uh, light years, and you ask the question, how bright is it? And so the brightness of an object from a distance of 10 parsecs is the absolute magnitude. If objects have different absolute magnitudes, there's only one reason for that. What is it? The luminosity, right? Because they're all the same distance. So the only way that you can have a different brightness is because the star has a different luminosity. So luminosity and absolute magnitude are connected to each other. You can calculate one from the other. So if you know luminosity, you know absolute magnitude. If you know absolute magnitude, you know luminosity. Uh, Cephian variables, what are the various Cephian variables? Stars which alter their brightness over a period, right? And who was the woman who's known for this? Henrietta Swan Levitt, right? Henrietta Levitt, right? Henrietta Swan Levitt. And she found this beautiful connection between the period and the luminosity. The longer the period, the higher the luminosity of the star. It's very simple, right? The longer period is longer, is higher than the uh, Binary stars, there are three ways to detect binary star systems. They're quite common, right? Probably at least half of the stars that we see are binary systems or multiple star systems. How do we see them? There's three ways. One is called visual, and we take photographs. How effective? Not very effective. It's the least effective. You've got to wait for a long time and watch the stars orbit each other. It's really a hard thing to do, but we have done it. There's a handful of stars in, that we have seen visual binaries. Spectroscopic binaries, up until Kepler, the Kepler Space Telescope, it was the best method. So two stars that are so close together that we can't see them as two stars still orbit each other and therefore will have a Doppler effect on their spectra. One star will be approaching us or coming towards us, radial velocity towards us. We'll see a blue ship. And one, the other one, will have to be simultaneously moving away from its red ship. So we can see that even if the stars can't be distinguished as separate stars. When we see two different spectra, we know there's two stars there, right? We know that. <clears throat> okay, and the third, which we now know is pretty, is also a pretty lucrative mechanism for finding them, is the eclipsing binary. The eclipsing binaries means that we can see the total light of the stars, and what happens is that the light changes. Sometimes we have little dips in the light, and so the eclipsing binary, uh, there's a picture I want to be able to remember. Uh, so I'm going to put in a Google search for eclipsing binary light curve. Eclipsing binary light curve. And there's our picture. That's the picture, right? And the picture shows a special kind of partnership, right? A red giant white dwarf partnership turns out to be a really important one we'll cover this tomorrow but uh, something interesting happens in these systems really interesting a certain type of supernova that happens in the system and it's really it's beautiful it's so perfect it's called the type 1a super i'm going to talk about it with you guys anyways today right i forgot okay so then, then let me tell you right now, today um this is uh when you get these systems the white dwarf is going to steal mass from the red giant. And every time it does, we get something called a nova, right? The nova is a flash of light. And what's happening is the white dwarf is a collapsed star, and it grabs some of the hydrogen from the outer layers, hydrogen and helium from the outer layers of the red giant, 
and it gets to the surface of the white dwarf, it's so hot, it's about 100 million Kelvin, that it immediately fuses. Okay, so it's a very, very interesting, fast phenomenon, pretty, pretty fast. Is that hot? I might be wrong, that seems kind of hot. Is it really not hot? I have to actually look that up. I think it's pretty hot though. Anyways, fuses very quickly. Actually, maybe it's not quite that hot. I don't know if you need to know the temperature anyways, but it's, it fuses, you get a nuclear fusion event, a flash of light, and a little tiny bit of mass is left on the white door. So we're gonna be learning, because if you haven't learned it yet, but you'll be reviewing with me in a minute, that white dwarfs are very interesting and they have collapsed, <clears throat> but not all the way. They could collapse even further, but they are prevented from collapsing by the force called the neutron, de uh, sorry, electron degeneracy pressure. So the forces of electrons pushing against each other prevents the white dwarf from collapsing any further. So gravity's pulling in, electrons are pushing back, and they're able to prevent gravity from collapsing it any further. But that only works if the mass of the white dwarf is less than something called Chandra Sekhar's limit, which you will need to memorize. And coincidentally, it's a number that you have already heard, 1.4 solar masses. <clears throat> if it goes above 1.4 solar masses, the force of gravity is too strong for the electrons to hold it back anymore. And you get an explosion called a type 1A supernova. So when a white dwarf gathers mass to itself, right, from the red giant, as soon as it steps up above 1.4 solar masses, it can't be a white dwarf anymore. It will explode. And so what will happen is the, meat, the material of the white dwarf is going to fuse almost all at once in a very spectacular fashion. The type 1A supernova will always have a mass of 1.4 solar masses. And so we know how bright it should be. It is one of the best standard candles because it will always be 1.4 solar masses. It will always have the same brightness, the same absolute magnitude, the same luminosity. So it's a standard candle, no matter where they explode in the universe, we know how bright it should be, the absolute magnitude. And we can compare that to what we see, but we can find the distance. Right? It's a really impressive one. <clears throat> so we'll talk about that in a few minutes. So, oh, I forgot to tell you what was important, sorry. Right? One more thing. You notice the dips, they're not symmetric, right? So when one is a deep dip, one is a shallow dip, which one is which? Why is it deep? Why is it shallow? It's deep because the bright, the hotter star is being eclipsed. And this one, the cooler star is being eclipsed, right? So the dip is not as deep. So the white dwarf, every square meter is hotter, so every square meter radiates more energy than for the red giant. Red giants are kind of cool in comparison. It's not a hundred. What is the temperature difference? I know it's not hundred dollars. It's that little. I'm off. I'm off. I'm off by readers and bubbles. I think it's a hundred thousand. Wait, a hundred thousand and I knew it was wrong. Okay, it just was wrong. hundred thousand is the temperature. How does this fusion happen? I don't know. Can't explain it. Don't worry, it happens anyway. Uh, maybe the pressures are just so big. I, I don't know. I'm not sure. That must be it. It's gotta be the pressures. Don't have to worry. You just know that it happens. Okay? So. Okay, proper motion is motion that is not towards you or away from you. It's uh, perpendicular to that. So you can't see that with the Doppler effect. And the radial velocity means towards you or away from you. That's the one that you can detect with the Doppler effect. Proper motion, in order to see that, you've got to watch the star for a long time, and then you'll be able to see it move. Okay. Uh, spectral classification. Is the uh, the, the uh, any cannon should have come first? Any cannon and the Harvard computers created a classification system. They began with ABCDEFG, but now we know the correct order, and the correct order is 
O B A fine girl guy giraffe whatever you want kiss me right so O stars are the hottest B are next A is next F is next G K M right so those are the correct order of the temperatures of star right Hertzsprung Russell diagram is the is the way that we display a set of stars on a single graph. And what we see is 90% of the stars are on one of the pieces called the main sequence. And the reason why is they spend 90% of their life on the main sequence. A main sequence star is a star that is fusing hydrogen in its core into helium. Right? That's what it's doing. What's a giant? A giant is a larger star, but not necessarily hotter. And because it's larger, it produces more light. Supergiant, same thing, except even larger in area, surface area, and so it produces a lot of light. White dwarfs are very compact, small objects, but very hot. We just found out 100,000. Okay, life expectancy mass relationship. As you go along the, I guess I should draw a little quick. Should we just look it up? Main sequence. Main sequence. HR diagram. HR diagram. Pretty HR diagram. That's very nice. Okay. Uh, so in the main sequence, HR diagram, the higher you go on the on the main sequence, the more massive the star, and the shorter length of time it will be on the main sequence. So, and then the further down we go, the smaller the mass of the star and the longer it will live. So the, the numbers that I asked you to memorize is coming up in a second. The most massive stars, maybe a hundred solar masses, live for a hundred thousand years. The Earth is a one solar mass. Its lifetime is 10 billion years. And the smallest mass, that can exist as a star is 0 0.08, right? 8% 8 solar mass, 8, 0.08 solar mass. And that one lives for 5.5 trillion years, maybe. Phil said a trillion, but we don't, you know, it's a huge number. Very, very long time. Okay, that's the relationship that you're supposed to be aware of. I did not match. I just don't know that. Okay, right door. Uh, turn off point. What's a turn off point? Turn off point is the idea that an uh, HR diagram may not be complete, or the main sequence may not be complete. So there's two kinds of HR diagrams that we might expect to see the HR diagram of an old cluster or the HR diagram of a young cluster and they're significantly different right so what's what does it look like let's just quickly draw the two types of clusters right so the HR diagram for an old cluster will show what what will it show it'll show that you've lost which stars you've lost the most massive stars on the left always. So the HR diagram for an old cluster is that normally we would expect to see something like that, the whole thing. But in the HR diagram for an old cluster, you're missing part of the diagram and they have branched over here and they have left the main sequence. So if you look at the HR diagram, you can identify the star classification that is missing. And if you go and look up how long they're supposed to live on the main sequence, you can now estimate the age of this old cluster. So old clusters, the large mass stars have left the main sequence because they've aged off. They already lived their whole life. And you can find the age of the cluster from this turnoff point. That's the turnoff point there. And a new cluster, a young cluster, right? Young cluster, same HR uh, main sequence. But this one 
It has these, but these have not gotten there yet. They might be coming in, right? Something like that. So in the, the young cluster, the lower part of the HR diagram is missing. They haven't gotten there yet. It's too young. But the upper ones where the large mass stars are, are there, they're running and they're doing their thing. Okay? So young and old have an incredibly different looking main sequence portions, right? Can you see that okay? Is it okay? Okay. All right, so back to, can you see it? Oh, yeah, you could see it at home, even if you're not there. Okay, uh, Okay. globular clusters, are they young or are they old? They're old. They've had a long time, and they stay together because of gravity. And they are made up of old stars, okay? So they're going to be the older type of cluster. Metallicity refers to the generations of stars. What happens each generation? You get more metallicity, right? So each generation gets enriched by the, the elements that are created in the star during its life. And also the ones that are made during the explosion. Turns out a lot are made during the explosion. Okay, how does the brightness of a star change as a function of distance? The further away you go, the dimmer the star. If you go twice as far, what happens to the brightness? It's one fourth as bright. Now we don't have to do any calculations, so this is just a simple kind of idea. But that's the formula. The brightness of the star is L, the luminosity, divided by four pi, don't care about that, the d squared is the distance. Okay. How does parallax work? Parallax works from Earth by what? Take a picture of the stars, and then how much later? Six months later, after we go to the other side of our orbit, we take another picture and it'll shift in its position compared to the background stars. This is called the parallax shift. And we know that the angles of these shifts are very small. You should know that they're less than a degree, right? They're less than a minute. They're less than a second, less than a second. The largest parallax for the closest star is like 0.78 seconds of arc. So the parallax angles are very tiny. Uh, this technique only works out to about um, a thousand, they say a thousand parsecs, a thousand light years or a thousand parsecs. It's a little bit different, but something like that. The technique is not good forever. It's only good for about, you know, I, I think he says 500 parsecs or a thousand light years, something like that. Something like that. Uh, all right. So blah, blah, blah. Okay. How is a standard candle used um, in astronomy to determine distance? So I mentioned um, the, the, the type 1a supernova is a standard candle. That's actually going to be one of our favorites. It's really a good one. But a standard candle is something that you know the absolute magnitude for. That's it. Just like that. If you know the absolute magnitude, what do you do? You compare it to what you see or the apparent magnitude. And then you can calculate the distance. So you compare what you know it should be to what you see, and then you know that it's either closer or further, and exactly how close or how far it is from you. But it lets you find the distance to an object. I determine a, from a comparison of apparent and absolute magnitudes whether a star is closer or further than 10 parsecs. So if you look at a star's apparent magnitude, that's little m, and absolute magnitude, big M, the numbers are often different, right? Usually different. The only way that they would be the same is if what? How would apparent magnitude be the same as absolute magnitude? The star is located 10 parsecs from the Earth, and then it would have the same number because they're the same, right? But if a star gets brighter when you go to absolute magnitude, what does that mean? It's further away than 10 parsecs from the Earth. And so by bringing it to 10 parsecs, you get a number that's a, a higher, when I said, did I say higher magnitude? Did I say brighter? It should be brighter, sorry. It would be a lower magnitude number, right? A lower magnitude number is brighter. Uh, what happens if a star gets, appears to get dimmer uh, when it comes to, when you do absolute magnitude, it must be closer than 10 parsecs, okay? That's the kind of idea, very simple. Uh, how do binary stars orbit a comet a center of gravity? Uh, this is really similar to how we talked about exoplanets before in the last test. But which, uh, which star will move more? Will, which star will have to move further in its orbit? The 
the smaller mass star. So in a, in a, when you have one larger mass and one smaller mass, the small mass has to move in a bigger circle in the same amount of time. The, small ma the big mass does a small circle. And so what they'll, they'll show you is different Doppler effects. Which one will have a bigger, bigger Doppler shift? The small mass, which moves faster, will have a bigger Doppler shift, right? So you can tell the, the relative masses as a result of this. What's proper motion and radial velocity? I think I told you proper motion across your field of view, radial velocity towards you or away from you. Right? How is a light curve used to understanding eclipsing binary? Well, I showed you the light curve a few minutes ago. Hopefully you remember uh, there's a dip. And the dip means that one of the stars is being eclipsed. But you get a bigger dip or a smaller dip according to which star is being eclipsed. When you have a bigger dip, what does it mean? The hotter star is being eclipsed. A smaller dip, the cooler star is being eclipsed. Okay? So when the hotter star is behind the cooler star, you get a bigger dip. That's the idea. <clears throat> what are the major categories on the HR diagram? Okay, so what are the, the, the categories that we talk about? I, that's a weird word. I don't think I use the right word. What are the, the names that we might give stars on the on the HR diagram? Most of them are aware. 90% of them are aware. It's called the main sequence, right? 90% of the stars are on the main sequence. But then we have three other categories. What are they? White dwarfs, red giants, red giants, or blue giants. It turns out there are some other colors, yellow giants, blue giants, and then the super giants. So where are they located, right? The white dwarfs are hot, but low in low luminosity. Giants are cool, but higher, and then super giants even higher. Uh, so they're going to be on the, on the right hand side of the of the HR diagram. Explain how the lifetime of the main sequence is related to the position of the main sequence. Okay, so uh, everything about stars is depends on this one factor. What is the one factor that determines everything about the life of the star? It's mass. Okay, so more mass means what? Gets to the main sequence faster, lives its life faster, and dies in a spectacular way, right? The smaller the mass, the longer it takes to get to the main sequence, the longer its life will be on the main sequence, less violent its death will be. Okay? Uh, I already did this. The turn on point I did, all right? Okay. What's the range of human seeing? I already told you that. Okay. So the dimmest star we can see is magnitude six. And then um, when you talk about magnitude numbers, when they change, you're supposed to be able to compare two stars or objects by looking at the magnitude number. So if you change by just one number, what factor does the brightness change by? 2.5, right? Which one's brighter, uh, a 7 or a 6? Which one's brighter? A 6 is brighter than a 7. Okay, how much brighter is 6 than a 7? 2.5 times is brighter. Okay, which one's brighter, a 4 or a 2? Two is brighter than four, right? The lower the number is brighter. How much brighter is two than a four? Not five. 2.5 times 2.5, which makes 6.25 times, right? About six. And then the last one is a, a five magnitude number difference, right? So which one's brighter? A, uh, a two. What's five? Five magnitude numbers brighter than a magnitude two star. Five magnitude numbers brighter. Negative three. Right? Negative three is five steps below a two. How much brighter is a negative three magnitude object than a two magnitude object? A hundred times brighter. Okay, so hundred times brighter. So that's the, those are the numbers you're supposed to memorize. Okay. Uh, blah, 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 degree. Okay, one degree is 60 minutes of arc. One arc minute is 60 seconds. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, parsecs, 3.26 uh, light years. But what's important about a parsec? A parsec is the distance at which an object would have one arc second for its parallax angle. And there are no stars that close. Right? I'll be a fine girl, kiss me. You got that. And the sun has a classification of G2 and Roman numeral V, which has to do with stuff that we don't have to cover. Okay? It has to do with the absorption lines that it has. And blah, blah, blah. Okay, so G2 is not just G, it's G2. There are actually 10 little subdivisions for every letter. Again, we're not covering that, but it's there. You know, you, you're aware of it. Okay, lifetime, we did that already. Okay, chapter 12, interstellar medium, and stuff like that. Okay, 
Interstellar medium means what? The stuff between the stars, right? And we learned today how many different types of interstellar media? Three or more? Two? You don't remember? How about this one? The first one is called the molecular cloud. And then the second one is called an H1 region. The second is called an H2 region. The third is called wisdom. As I say three, then the fourth is called. The fourth is called wisdom, and the fifth is called coronal gas. Right? So there's five different interstellar mediums that we talked about. So uh, they're they're listed here. Molecular clouds. What do you know about them? Are they hot or cool? Really cool. Ten Kelvin. Like almost. Like you don't have to know ten Kelvin. Just know that it's really cool. Made of what? Molecules. Right? Which are two or more atoms that are joined together. To form a, a compound, right? Something that's um, more a molecule, form a molecule. Never mind. <clears throat> and what's special about them? How do you see them? What kind of light do we see? And the answer is we see spectra, kind of like absorption or emission spectra that we saw from a single star. And uh, you don't have to know, but it's in the infrared. But whatever, you don't have to know. Okay, molecular clouds, H1. What's H1? Hydrogen. But what kind of hydrogen? Neutral hydrogen gas, right? Neutral. So is it kind of hot or not so hot? Not so hot. It's about 100 Kelvin, but it's just hot enough to ionize, right? It's not hot enough to be ionized. So does it does it have any thermal radiation? Does it have black body radiation? Yes. Anything over zero has black body radiation. But is it something that we could see with our eyes? The answer is no, right? It's very cool. Remember, we're 300 Kelvin, so 100 is pretty small, and this thing radiates radio waves more than anything else. Okay? It has a famous number, the 21 centimeter line is a famous radio radiation that was detected. It's the strongest from some of these clouds. Okay? So it was a pretty prominent part of the radio spectrum that people noticed first. Okay? Uh, H2, again hydrogen, but this is different. This is hot hydrogen. Talking like 10,000 Kelvin, like the surface of the sun hot. So it is radiating with visible light and it's ionized, which means it produces light, uh, light when the electrons drop down into smaller energy states, right? Lower energy states. And so one of the colors that you learned to look for is called the hydrogen alpha. And it's a red color. So red or pink that we see coming from hydrogen is from hydrogen alpha. A certain drop is from level three to level two, but you don't need to know that. Okay? I don't need to know that. Just reminding myself that I know that. Okay. Uh, photo ionization. Actually, uh, what's the idea? Photo ionization. Actually, that's an interesting word. Why am I having that in there? Usually thermal ionization. But photo ionization means what? Light causes the atoms to be ionized. So, high photo ionization means that high energy photons hit an atom, and they rip the electrons off of the atom and cause it to be ionized. So photo, meaning light, ionization, meaning you rip the electrons off of the atom and form an ion. Reflection nebula, and what was the other one? An emission nebula. So reflection nebula, what colors are emission nebulas? They can be blue, or the same color as the stars, right? Because what do they do? They reflect the light of the stars. What's an emission nebula? Red, right? Usually red because of the emission from hydrogen. What's the free fall time? The free fall time is the time when a star is forming and the gas is falling without anybody slowing it down. Eventually, when it gets hot, that will start to slow it down a little bit. But this falling time, when there's nothing to really slow it down, is called the free fall time, which is most of the time of formation of a star. So what do you need to know about that? You don't actually need to know the numbers, but you need to know the more mass it has, the shorter the free fall time will be, right? The less time it will take. Herbig Haro is a special kind of um, protoplanetary object, right? I left off the word protoplanetary disk, but whatever. A proto star with this protoplanetary disk sometimes has jets, and that's called the Herbig Haro object. And I left out CNO. What's CNO? 
CNO is carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And what would you say? A more efficient way to do nuclear fusion for larger mass stars. It's still nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium. A brown dwarf, too small to light up. So less than 0 0.08 solar masses. Open star cluster or a, um, yeah, open star cluster, what's that? It's a group of young stars that will eventually drift apart. We think our sun was actually originally part of one. Okay. All right. Okay, now we're going to get some new stuff. Okay. I described the differences. I think I've done all of this along the way, but let's just make sure. Uh, what are the differences in the in the ISM? Okay, so actually I forgot. Wisdom is almost the same temperature, but what's the difference between Wisdom and H2 regions? They both release and uh, they both emit hydrogen alpha, but Wisdoms are low density, right? Very low density. So H2s can be higher densities. Stars can form there. Wisdoms are too low a density. And stars won't form there. And then the last one, coronal gases. I didn't mention. What's special about them? They're incredibly hot, like a million Kelvin. What kind of light do they radiate as a result of that? X-ray light, right? That's X-rays coming out of that. Okay. Uh, oh, I already told you that. Okay. Uh, compare the light from emission versus reflection. I just taught that, right? Okay. Clearly state the relationship between true fall time and the mass of the star. Well, the greater the mass, the shorter the free fall time, right? Everything happens faster with a bigger mass. Okay? Describe the likely reasons for jets. Why do they come out of the protoplanetary did what's happening what's the underlying force coming from the magnetic field okay magnetic field along the axis okay that's all we're really trying to say just hey you see jets magnetic field is causing it okay how well that's a complicated story it's actually we do know a little bit more than that but not in this class right this class we're like Shh, i don't get it it's confusing okay it is it's really confusing i already did this as well um, what's the difference between HR of a young or an old cluster, right? I showed you the pictures already. Okay, so jumping here to the end of stars. Okay, we're jumping right into it. <laughs> and some of this is new, so sorry about that. But let's go ahead and see if we can explain uh, each step of the way. A type 2 supernova is a massive star that will fuse fuel after fuel all the way to iron. A type two supernova is a massive star, and I'll get to the numbers in just a second. Actually, they're on the bottom. Let's just go we'll look down here. Uh, look right here. Um, here and this is what I call small, medium, large. Okay, so I'm giving you some sense of what I mean by that. Small. Less than eight solar masses, medium between eight to twenty solar masses, large, greater than twenty solar masses. So here's the crazy thing: if a star has more than eight solar masses, it will keep fusing higher and higher elements all the way to the magic one. What's the magic one? Iron, iron right? It'll go all the way to iron. Now, what's special about iron is it's at the peak of the efficiency of nuclei. You can't do better than iron. Iron is the most energy per nucleon. You cannot do better. But the star will try, right? The star will take the ash, which is iron, in its core, and, hey, let me just fuse that. Okay? And it does it. It fuses the iron. But what do you get when you fuse iron? Something more or less efficient? Less, which means it doesn't release energy, it absorbs energy. So the moment, like less than a second, like a fraction of a second, after a star begins to fuse iron, it's dead. It's dead and collapsing because it doesn't release energy anymore. You got to the pinnacle, you got to the highest point, iron, and you can't do any better than that. Okay, so as soon as a star begins to fuse iron, it's dead. It's going to collapse. And we call this a type 2 supernova. How do you get a type 2 supernova? It's got to get all the way to iron. How do you get to all the way to iron? You have to have enough mass to keep generating ash, collapsing, 
heating and fusing that ash, creating a new ash, it becomes fuel at that point, right? And then get all the way to iron and then try to fuse iron and fail, right? Because you got to fail at some point. Iron just doesn't produce energy. So type 2 supernova, you've gone all the way and that's it. Then you explode. So what is the mass of a type 2 supernova? Anything above 8, does that actually tell you the number? Anything above 8 does not actually tell you the number. Do we know the absolute magnitude of type 2 supernovas? If you don't know the mass, you don't know the absolute magnitude. It's, it's something that could be different. Are type 2 supernovas good candidates for a standard candle? No, not yet. I mean, it turns out with some work, you might be able to get there. And there are people working on that. You can look at the, the explosion curve and of the light, and you can actually figure things out, but not simply. It's not a standard candle. Okay, everybody good? Okay, so I talked about a bunch of stuff. So we'll have to talk about tomorrow. Okay, type two supernova. Hydrogen shell burning. Okay, we talked about that today. The first red giant stage of the sun will occur when it runs out of hydrogen in the core. It ran out of hydrogen. There's no more hydrogen in the core. What happens to the core at that point? The helium in the core will just collapse and will not be able to fuse right away. It just requires a very high temperature. We said 100 million Kelvin. But what will happen is, as it collapses, the core will heat up, and it gets hot enough that the area just outside the core reaches that 10 million and can begin fusing hydrogen. So you get what is called hydrogen shell burning. Well, this is actually releasing a lot more energy than before. And so the star blows up and get not blows up, sorry, it expands. That's what I meant. It expands. And remember, we said that it's going to get pretty big. Even the Earth might be inside of that star that forms. And it will be at that point a red giant. Now, um, I didn't get to the point yet where we talk about this helium flash. Anybody want to predict what helium flash means? Helium flash, uh, okay. helium flash, what's helium? Yes. It is, where is it found? A lot of it, of in the core, right? We built up a lot of helium by converting the hydrogen into helium in the core. Is it fusing right away? No, it's not hot enough, but what will happen is if it's not hot enough, then which force is gonna pull it together? Gravity, and as it pulls it together, what will happen to the temperature? It will get hotter. And at some point, it will reach the critical temperature of 100 million Kelvin. And what will happen? The helium will begin to fuse. So now it's fuel, right? So the sun will be capable of fusing helium. Why? It's got enough mass. The sun has enough mass to fuse helium. What do you get when you fuse helium? You want to write this down because you need to know. The fusion of helium produces carbon and oxygen. <clears throat> so the ashes that are produced in this process from the fusion of hydrogen, a helium, is carbon and oxygen. Will the sun get hot enough eventually to fuse the carbon and oxygen? No, the sun is not big enough to ever fuse carbon or oxygen. So the sun, once it runs out of helium, is done. It will run out of fuel. There will not be any more fuel. So the sun will fuse hydrogen into helium and helium into carbon and oxygen. Okay, it does both, by the way, not just carbon, not just oxygen. So helium flash is that moment when the helium finally gets hot enough to begin fusion. Well, that's more energy than before. The star will actually even expand a little bit more. This is the second stage of the red giant of the sun. Right, so first stage was hydrogen shell burning, and now you have simultaneous hydrogen shell burning and helium core burning simultaneously, producing even more energy, making it expand even greater. Okay, so the second part of its red giant stage. It will continue to do this all the way until it runs out of helium in the core. And then what will happen? Once it runs out of helium in the core, what will the sun do? It's going to collapse. And that, uh, okay, so let's, let's talk. I gotta talk a little bit more. Okay, planetary nebula is a very beautiful idea. Actually, let's go ahead and look at some pictures. What's a planetary, what's nebula? 
Glowing gases. What's a planetary definition? Glowing gases. Okay. Planetary definition. Planetary nebula. Okay, there's an example. It's a beautiful example. It's called M57, the ring nebula. Beautiful, right? Isn't it pretty? Beautiful. That's real. That's real. Okay. Beautiful colors, right? So um, the ring nebula is an example of a simple planetary nebula. What, why is it called that? Well, because they thought it was a planet at first. They didn't know that it wasn't a planet. And it was only later that we realized it's just gases that are glowing. Why are they glowing? They're getting energized. What's energizing them? There's a tiny little spark in the middle of it called the white dwarf. There's a white dwarf. In the middle of it. And the white dwarf is really hot. What color does a white dwarf produce more than any other? Ultraviolet. Yeah, I know we call it white, but anyway, it produces ultraviolet. Ultraviolet is a high energy photon, remember? And so it smashes into gases that, I'm sorry, the light hits the gases and excites them and they start glowing. It'll last about 500 years, right? So at the end of the life of a, because the, the gases are going to go away. Okay, so what happened? Where did these gases come from? These gases come in the later stages of the life of a star, during the red giant phase. When the star is huge, it starts to lose layers, the outer layers of the star. Why does it lose that? Well, the star is going to produce energy in kind of fits and spurts. Sometimes it'll just have a burst of energy. And that burst of energy will be a, a little push that wasn't there before. And the outermost layer of the star is very far away from the core. So what happens to the gravitational force when you're very, very far away? It's much weaker. And so the little puff of energy that, it, that comes out periodically is enough to blow a shell of material away from the star. And so it just starts moving away from the star, like on its own, right? And so little by little, the mass of the star is actually blown away. The outer layers of the star are blown away. 60% or more of the mass can be lost during this period. So a huge amount of mass is actually blown away. And it's only later that we begin to see it, right? It's only after the star has finally died that we begin to see it. So the planetary nebula was formed when a red giant like our sun, our sun is going to make one, by the way, it, it blows away shells of material, which are near the edge, and little by little, it blows away shells of material of the red giant and leaves behind a much smaller amount of material, maybe 40 or even less percent. So this is not the only planetary kind of nebula. Let me show you another one. Let's show you something more interesting. Oh, that's definitely interesting. This is the, this is the rose nebula. <clears throat> this is more fun, isn't that pretty? Very beautiful. And is it a sphere? Oh, so by the way, the ring nebula was a sphere. It just looked like a ring, but it's really a sphere, right? A sphere, a shell of material. But this one's more interesting, right? This one's definitely interesting. Why does it look like this? We don't know, but we have some ideas, right? One idea that I think is really cool, and I'm going to tell you is my favorite idea, which means you should know it is that when the star is expanding to become the red giant, it's gonna heat up the planets that are nearby. And that means that those planets are inside of the star, but they're like stirring the material of the star, right? And so when the star releases these puffs of energy, it may not be spherically symmetric, it might be a little more accent where the planet is. In fact, it could even burn up the planet as well, right? So you can get bursts of, of material that are not symmetric, right? So I think these beautiful shapes, and I like this explanation, are coming probably because the red giant eats up more than one planet, right? First one, first interesting feature, maybe the second piece over here. The second wave, the second interesting feature is another planet that gets eaten up. Each time it eats a planet, it's gonna be stirred and mixed and then release more energy and material. I think that's the best explanation. Okay, so these are wonderful shapes. They're all different. They're unique. This is a particular nebula. There's another. There's a cassite nebula. There's all kinds of different ones. Uh, 
there's another one that's kind of cool. It's more elongated, right? It's almost spherical, but it's got this elongation. They're all different. That's another one. That's a very funny one. Look at all these super shapes, right? These are all planetary nebula. So where do they come from? Red giants in the later stages of life are going to eject shells of material in every direction. And when the star finally dies, it will collapse and form a white dwarf. And that energy from the white dwarf illuminates the, the, the gas clouds and makes them glow for like 500 years. Okay, so what kind of star will make planetary nebula? A small mass star makes planetary nebula. Small, less than eight solar masses. Will our sun do it? Our sun will do it too, okay? So our sun is an example of a star that will make planetary nebula. Okay, Messier objects named after Charles Messier. Um, again, we won't know detail, just a little bit of detail. Charles Messier was a uh, comet hunter. And when he looked for comets, the way that he would tell that they were comets is they were fuzzy stars, fuzzy looking stars. And he didn't have a very good telescope apparently because he didn't know that they weren't stars. They were actually something much more interesting. So now there are 110 of these objects uh, that we look at and amateur astronomers love them because they're really cool, right? They're clusters of stars and they're galaxies and they're glowing nebulae. And almost all of them are really cool and interesting. Okay, so some of them are planetary nebulae, they're galaxies, they're star clusters, they're really interesting. They're called the Messier objects. Okay, so they look just like fuzzy little blobs, but they didn't move. And so that's why he knew that it wasn't a comet, and he kept track of them and made a list of this 110 objects. So we like them. Uh, Roche lobe, uh, I've got to talk about that. All right. And uh, there's a, a special kind of pair that we've talked about, uh, James Kaler. Was the first to study these the red giant white dwarf companion right that's a very interesting one and put that kind of system together then you get an interesting situation there's a distance remember the roche limit roche limit that was the distance at which tidal forces would rip a body apart well it turns out that a um, a roche lobe is the idea See if I can get red giant white dwarf. So there's our red giant, red giant, and then the white dwarf. And what happens is that the red giant outer material is only weakly held by gravity, right? If the material gets too close to the white dwarf, and the white dwarf's gravitational force takes over and sucks it away. That's the Roche lobe, right? The idea that if you go beyond a certain level, the gravity from this can actually be more powerful and pull it on. So the white dwarf steals matter from its companion. And every time it does, what do you get? A flash called a nova, right? It's called a nova. And there is actually an accretion, but anyways, it eventually slams onto the white dwarf, causing the white dwarf's mass to go up a little bit. The interesting thing is that white dwarfs can only be up to 1.4 solar masses. But maybe I should talk a little bit about why that is. And that's actually coming up in the next uh, thing right here. That is the next word. The next word is called the Chandra Sekhar Manila. So Subramanyam Chandra Sekhar was an, an Indian uh, astronomer, astrophysicist, who was studying something called, uh, well, fermions. He was studying electrons and the, and the quantum physics behind electrons. And he discovered something really interesting. And, and it has to do with, um, you may not know this, but an electrons inside of an atom, no two electrons can be the same. No two electrons can have the same set of quantum numbers. Uh, we don't cover this in this class, but they have to be unique. Okay, that's enough to say that. And consequently, it means that two electrons don't want to occupy the same space at the same time. And so they are repelling each other, right? Well, we know that they repel each other because of their negative charges, but there's another reason they repel each other, 
which is called the Pauli exclusion principle. You don't need to know that. And then in the book, he brings up a further idea called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And it says that if you try to squish a particle into too small of a space, something happens. If you squish it down, suddenly you can't control its, its velocity. It starts getting more and more velocity the more you try to confine it. So something weird happens when you try to squish electrons together, they fight against that. And so we have a name and it should be up there. It's called electron degeneracy pressure. So that's the force of electrons pushing off of each other. They don't want to get together. <clears throat> so what happens to a star like our sun when it finally runs out of fuel, right? We know the answer. What's the answer? It collapses, right? What force is making, making it collapse? Gravity. So it's starting to collapse, right? It collapses and collapses. And collapses. But it turns out it makes something called a white dwarf. Why is the white dwarf there? Well, there must be something that's preventing that object from collapsing. And it turns out it's the atoms themselves. It's the electrons themselves. The electrons of the atoms are going to push on each other. And so you end up with a small little ball of matter called a white dwarf, which is, is now no longer collapsing because the strength of the electrons is enough to hold back gravity. So a white dwarf is a, a small object, compact object. I'll talk about how big in a second. But it's a star, leftover remnant, the core of a star that collapsed. And, and it stopped collapsing because the electrons pushed back as hard as gravity pulled in. So I've got that the electrons are pushing back. Um, and so we have a name that's called the white dwarf. How big is a white dwarf? So you take a star and you squish it down, and it turns out it gets to be about the size of the planet Earth. So how big is a star typically? 100 times the size of a planet? It squishes down to just the size of a planet. So that's a really interesting thing. It's very dense. But it turns out that it's incredibly dense. It's a very dense object. Pretty cool, right? Pretty interesting. Very hot, sorry, really hot. Uh, but it's being held from keeping it from collapsing by the electron degeneracy pressure. So that's the pushback against gravity. The problem is that uh, Chandrasekhar discovered that the electrons could only push so hard. They're strong, but they're only so strong. And so there's a limit to how strong they can be. And what happens is if the mass of the, the remnant, the core of the star, is too big, then gravity is too strong, and the electrons cannot hold back gravity. And Chandrasekhar discovered that the limit was 1.4 solar masses. As long as the remnant is less than 1.4, the electrons are strong enough to hold back gravity. But the moment that they get too much uh, mass, the electrons are not, no longer strong enough. So we said that it's going to be a type 1a supernova. We'll get to that in a second. Uh, so neutron degeneracy pressure is a, is a different thing, which I feel like I shouldn't talk about that yet. Let me let me keep going with the uh, Chandra Yeah. Is there a sign machine? Hmm? A sign machine? It's right behind you somewhere, maybe. Is that it? Yes. That could be it. <laughs> no, that's not it. Who's got the attendant sheet? And a chief. Then take it. Huh? Oh, you forgot that. Who left? Oh, no, it's here. I was wrong. I did take it back. I can use it here. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so the mechanism, uh, 
for a type 1a supernova is you have to have a white dwarf and a red giant companion willing to give mass to it okay so the white dwarf is going to keep stealing mass right and the nova goes up every time it steals the mass but it also gains a little bit of mass so the white dwarf gets a little bit more massive each time well this is fine as long as it's less than 1.4 solar masses, everything's fine, no problem. But the day, the moment that the mass exceeds 1.4 solar masses, gravity is too strong. The electrons are not strong enough anymore. So what will happen? The whole thing collapses at once, and we call it a runaway nuclear fusion event. Runaway nuclear fusion. All of the carbon and oxygen that was left over in the ashy core, right? In the ash of the core, almost simultaneously ignites and fuses and makes a huge burst of energy. It's a type 1A supernova. It's incredible, right? It's an incredible amount of energy. Uh, so runaway thermonuclear fusion. All right, so anyways, uh, let's go back and talk about neutron degeneracy pressure. Okay. So what was Chandrasekhar's limit? Do you remember the number? 1.4 solar masses. Well, what if the star was a little more massive, by the way, a medium star, between 8 and 20 solar masses? A star which is less than 8 solar masses at the end of its life will have less than 1.4 solar masses left over in the core. So I left out maybe a tiny little detail. When the thing finally collapses, the core collapses fast, and the outside part is kind of slow. And so the outside part actually gets blown away at the very last second, and you're only left with the core when you're finished. So the white dwarf is the leftover core material, not the material that tried to fall behind it. That gets blown away. And so the and then it will light up and it will make a planetary nebula. Uh, so if your starting mass, initial mass, is less than eight, by the time you're finished and you collapse, you have less than 1.4 solar masses left over in the core. So you've really lost a huge percentage of your mass. Actually, that's almost 80% of your mass, right? More than 80%, sorry, it's like almost, okay, that's huge. No, it's not, say 80, it's about 80, right? A little less than, a little more than 80. All right, so what happens if your starting mass is between eight and 20 solar masses, you're gonna go all the way to iron. You're gonna go all the way to iron. So what happens as a consequence? When you get to iron, you're gonna collapse and uh, the star is gonna die. But that process of collapsing is gonna take that iron and collapse it down to a really tiny object. The electrons can't stop it. The electrons can't stop it. So where do the electrons go? Where do the electrons go? Well, they end up going into the nuclei of the atoms, right? They go into the nuclei. They're not supposed to go there, but they do anyways, right? When your leftover mass is more than 1.4 solar masses, then the electrons are not strong enough to hold this whole gravity back. So the electrons, will go into the nucleus where they will find protons. And maybe you can figure out what happens when an electron gets together with a proton. One electron together with one proton. Anybody want to figure that one out? I showed you something the other day. I think you could probably figure this out. What happens? They combine to form a neutron. Okay. So the name neutron star is indicating that we went to a stage where the electrons couldn't be electrons anymore. They got squished into the nucleus where they found protons and became a ball of neutrons. Okay, this is amazing stuff. This is freaky. This is crazy. It's, uh, it's almost unbelievable how dense this material is. It's the density of a nucleus which is incredible, okay. I'm gonna just tell you a couple of things. Number one, it's incredibly dense, right? It's a neutron. But the neutrons, they push up against each other and have some strength, right? Just like the size of a, a nucleus has some strength. It stays together, 
the neutrons and the and the protons don't don't uh, combine. They can stay as separate particles. This force of the neutrons being strong enough to keep themselves from going any further is called the neutron degeneracy pressure. So when is this important? When you go above 1.4 solar masses. But it turns out that you can't keep going too far because at some point the neutrons won't be strong enough either. So I want you to write down between 1.4 and three solar masses, that what will happen is the electrons won't be strong enough, so they will combine with the protons to form a big ball of neutrons. And this is what we call a neutron star. A single star collapses down to something which is only 10 kilometers across, 10 miles across, 20 kilometers, okay? It's the size of a city, the size of Santa Barbara area, right, Goleta, Carpenteria. That's how it passes down to something tiny like that. This is incredibly dense. How about this one? There's another way. If I took the entire Earth and squished it down to the same thing, neutron material, how big would the entire Earth be? The entire Earth. The whole Earth, 8,000 miles across, 12,800 kilometers across. How big would it be? The size of a bowling ball. The entire Earth would fit into all the size of a bowling ball at this density. Are you getting some idea? This stuff is crazy. It's crazy. It's just, it's insane. It's crazy. All right, anyway, all right, blah, blah, blah. If you, and so what, what happens? If you're between 1.4 and 3, the neutrons are strong enough to hold back gravity. What happens if you go above 3? The leftover mass is above 3. What holds gravity back? What's strong enough to hold gravity back? Nothing is strong enough. Gravity will do something crazy, which is collapse it down, we say, to a single point, a singularity. But what you get is something crazy called a black hole. Right? Gravity is so strong that nothing, electrons aren't strong enough, neutrons aren't strong enough, nothing can hold back gravity. So you get something very extremely weird, even stranger than neutron stuff. Okay, that's going to be the black hole. Weak nuclear force? Anybody tell me what that is? Weak nuclear force? Why is it important? It's the stability of a neutron. It's how neutrons and protons get made with quarks. This process that I just showed you, where the protons combine with the electron to make a neutron, is that's the weak nuclear force, right? That makes that possible. To think about that. Uh, stellar ejecta is material that gets ejected from the exploding star. Okay? including lots of the elements on the periodic table. Thermonuclear runaway is the idea that in a type 1a supernova, you get sim almost simultaneous uh, nuclear fusion of all of the carbon and oxygen fuel. Does that happen in a type 2 supernova? No, it doesn't. But what happens is that the core collapses and forms this neutron star, but the rest of the material gets ejected back, and there's actually a big wave of nuclear fusion that happens there too. And so there's a huge explosion, which is this type 2 supernova. Type 2 supernovas, by the way, are pretty powerful compared to type 1a supernova. Uh, pulsar, what's a pulsar? Pulsar, you're going to learn, is a rapidly rotating neutron star. It pulses. So we see them like little light beacons. They shine at us, and then they turn away. And they shine at us. Okay, I don't know if I'm going to punch everything. Uh, leave my back here. Uh, gravitational wave um, is... A concept that is really interesting is that space and time are connected to each other. And they make something called space-time, right? The universe has the space-time everywhere. And what Einstein told us that the gravity is, a, is not real. It's not a force. It's a warping of the gravitational, uh, the gravity uh, is a, it's a warping of space-time. So what happens is that when you don't have matter, space-time is flat. It's not really flat in the, in the sense that it's like a flat surface. It's three-dimensional, but it doesn't have a curvature to it. When you put matter there, space-time becomes curved and, and it changes. And we have this feeling that there's gravity, but it's not real. It's just a, a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. Space and time are connected. 
There is no such thing as absolute space, and there's no such absolute time. So again, I, I, I don't think I can really cover all of this right now in 20 minutes even. But I'm going to tell you that you and I observe time in a very similar way because we are together on the earth. But at the moment that we start leaving the earth and going really fast or far from the earth, our clocks won't run in the same way. We won't experience time in the same way. Time, what you and I think of as very firm and certain, is not at all. It's flexible and changes. Time is relative. So you might have watched the movie Interstellar, anybody? Nobody saw that movie, okay. Well, uh, you're gonna need to learn some ideas that time is flexible and changes depending on your perspective. So your perspective really affects what you see. Anyway, all right, so back to the gravitational wave. Gravitational waves were first detected a whole lot, a really long time ago, just kidding, 2015. It's really new, it's brand new. Gravitational waves are ripples in space-time, in the fabric of space-time. They're little tiny waves. And they were first postulated by Einstein. He said, hey, there's this stuff called space-time, it's like a fabric and it has tension in it. It should ripple like waves. And he said, well, you know, anytime something happens in the, in the universe, it should make little ripples. Well, he was right. It does. And we have discovered that when these things called black holes or other things smash together, they make beautiful little ripples that we can feel on Earth. So in 2015, we detected the very first ones, the real uh, gravitational wave. Since then, we have had two more events. So there's three altogether that are officially declared, right? They have detected others, but they have a really very uh, stringent requirement for publishing the paper. It's called Five Sigma. Maybe you guys don't know what that means. But they're really careful. Before they say that they, they felt anything, they're trying to be really, really careful. So last year, August 17th, 2017, you notice I'm slowing down because you need to know that. August 17, 2017, we discovered that uh, we felt the ripples of the merger of two neutron stars. This has never been seen before. So again, I don't have enough time to explain all these details, but when black holes merge, which is what we felt before, there cannot be any light coming out of the merger. You can't see anything, they're black holes. We'll talk about that tomorrow, I guess. I don't have time today. <clears throat> but black holes are black because the gravitational field traps light as well. Light is affected by gravity. That's a new thing, I know, I'm sorry. Too many new things. Black hole mergers do not have any light coming out of them. But neutron star mergers shine with light and for the very first time in the entire history of human beings, neutron stars smashed together, made ripples in space-time, and we saw the light. It has a name. It's called a kilo nova. It's a thousand times as bright as a nova, kilo nova. Right? Up until now, we had seen maybe flickers of them, but never knew what was caught. Up until now, we had seen maybe flickers of them, but never knew what was causing it. Now we know. And these are super exciting because it's the very first time that we've been able to see what's causing the gravitational waves to form. Okay. So there's too much to talk about, but let's just that. Uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you this stuff. All right. Um, what should I do? So we just try to finish this at least. Should I try to finish this? Yeah, let me try to finish this. Good. There's a straight here, and we guessed our attention before. So in the in the 1700s, um, when Charles Messier was looking, actually the first object he looked at was Messier number one. And it has a name now, it's called the Crab Nebula. So it's a nebula, glowing gases. But as he watched it over the years, and, and other people watched it, he noticed something really interesting. It was growing, it was getting bigger. What does that mean? getting bigger, it's expanding, expanding. And one of the most beautiful things, right? Most beautiful things, they calculated the expansion speed. 
And then they turned around and they said this, when did it start? Right? And where did it start from? And they calculated that it should be somewhere in the year a thousand something. They weren't sure exactly when, but you know, 1054 turned out to be the answer, that it was around the 1050s, right? Like 700 years earlier, they figured out it must have started. And they went back and looked, and it turns out at that time, the Chinese astrologers were really careful in their observation. They had made beautiful drawings. And the story came out that a guest star appeared in the year 1054, in the summer of 1054. And this star was so bright that it could be seen during the daytime for 21 days. Have you ever seen a star during the daytime? Never, except for the sun, right? You could see it during the daytime for 21 days and for two years at night. So it was the guest star of the year 1054. And the position was exactly at the center of this expanding cloud. And so they made the conclusion that the, the guest star and the cloud are from the same thing. And they had seen their first supernova. So this was the very first supernova that we ever confirmed and exploding, a type two supernova, and exploded. And then the shock wave and the cloud of expanding material came from that. So the Crab Nebula is a supernova remnant, right? And we, we tracked it back and actually found a record of a guest star of 1054. All right, so how is matter lost in the giant or supergiant stages? So I alluded to this with the red giant. It turns out supergiants are even bigger. When you have a supergiant, the matter is extremely far from the core, and therefore the gravitational field is weak. And so what it does is it sloughs off layers of itself. They just get blown away from the main star. And a huge percentage of the mass leaves in this, in this stage. So between, I think it's like 60 to 70, 60 to 80 percent, uh, 60 to 70 percent, sorry, 60 to 70 percent is leaving during this stage. So during the red, uh, the giant or the supergiant stage, the material which is far from the center is going to be blown away by things that are happening in the star. We're not worried too much about this. What are some of the reasons for planetary nebulas? Beautiful patterns, not always symmetric. I gave you a reason. What was it? Where they swallow or eat up their planets. Yeah, that's probably, I like that. That's my favorite. Okay, so just go with that. Uh, describe how the final mass of the core leads to either a white dwarf, less than 1.4, and a white dwarf, what force is working against gravity to keep it from collapsing? Electron degeneracy pressure. And if you have more than 1.4, up to about 3, what force is needed to keep it from collapsing? Neutron degeneracy pressure. Above 3, what stops gravity? Nothing. It collapses even further, and we'll get to this thing called a black hole. I think I have to do it tomorrow. Uh, I'll do it as much as I can. Uh, why can we only see a small number of pulsars? Pulsars are stars that pulse with energy. So uh, let me just find one last little thing here. I mean, I'll keep going if you guys want to keep going. I'm actually fine. Yeah. Make it a little longer. Uh, pulsars here. That's not really bad. Pulsars. So this is the pulsar, and they're incredibly magnetic. Uh, they have very strong, powerful magnetic fields, and they have jets that come out of that magnetic field. This thing is rapidly rotating. There are things called millisecond pulsars. Millisecond. What's a millisecond? Anybody know what that means? One thousandth of a second. These things are rotating a thousand times per second. A star is rotating a thousand times per that doesn't blow you away, huh? You don't have any idea what that means. Think about it. A star mass object is rotating a thousand times. It's just you've never seen an angel like this. This is an incredibly why is it rotating so fast? What makes it rotate so fast? You know the answer. You know the answer. Was the star rotating when it started? Sure. What happens when you squish it down to a much, much smaller size? Conservation of angular momentum, okay? It turns out there's even more, but whatever, we're just getting up that. So the beam that you get, the jets, shoot out at an angle, it turns out, compared to the axis. 
If the earth is in the jet, will we see it? Yes, we will. But it will start rotating and the jet will no longer look at us, right? So we call it the lighthouse model, right? Like a lighthouse sweeps a beam of light. Every time you see the light, it's because it's pointing at you. You don't see it when it's not pointing at you. So the lighthouse model says that when the earth is in the beam, we see it. And it'll turn on and off, right? What would happen if you, um, okay, so you watch that, you can see the flashes of light, you see flickers of light. We'll talk about tomorrow in class, unless you want to say, I'll tell you more of the story. It was first detected by radio astronomers, and that's a fun story. Okay. But anyways, this is a pulsar that shines with light. Why do you think we can't see most of the pulsars in the Milky Way? Why do we not see them? It's a pretty simple answer. What was that? Are we not in the We're not what? Are we not in the We're just not in the beam. Yeah. We're not in the beam. If we're not in the beam, we can't see it. So it's not that they're not there. They're probably there. But we just can't see them because the beam never points towards Earth. Okay? Unless the alignment is good, we won't see it at all. Okay? So most of the pulsars we can't see. We can only see a small fraction of them. But we do see some, and they are uh, quite a few. Uh, so I don't know what you guys want to do. You want to go a little bit more? I'm happy to do that. I don't want to. You guys just move on. Is it helpful? I'm just going to give you a little bit of a Too much stuff. That's what I described. Okay. Okay. What happened? August 17, 2017. There was an event. I'm going to show you a video tomorrow. Let me not show you today because I'm going to show you tomorrow. But on August 17, 2017, we detected the first kilo nova. And the interesting thing is that that turns out to be a pretty important event. And much of the heavier elements on the periodic table are made in this kind of event. So we had never seen that happen before. Okay, trying to say go blah, blah, blah. Want to go on? Should we keep going? Or you got enough? Who wants to keep going? You gotta go. So I keep going. Okay, I'll keep going for anybody wants to stay. All right, you don't have to stay though, don't worry. It's all option. Are you covered for me? So again, I should cover this tomorrow. Okay, I'm all done. But um, here's the idea a black hole is this thing that has so much mass left over, more than three solar masses, that nothing can stop gravity. Okay, it just keeps going and collapses. So the most important idea is that the force of gravity is extremely powerful near these things. And we have a, an idea of a black hole. <clears throat> that is this is a new idea uh, that you need to, be, need to be aware of. Is that black holes, gravity, it turns out also affects light. Okay? It's not actually that actually I did this book. Gravity also affects light. So when you shoot a beam of light across the room, it falls. It doesn't fall very much, though, because light is so fast. It's like shooting a bullet. If you shoot a bullet, it drops because of gravity. The faster you go, though, the less time it spends traveling across the room, the smaller the distance it can fall. But it turns out light falls in gravity. And I, actually, I was going to tell you about that. But before I get to that, here's the idea. That near a black hole, I'll do it over here so you can all see this. I can go through Okay, let's see how that works. Okay, if you have this point where all the matter is collapsed, it has a name. It's called the singularity. It's called the singularity. Okay, I find it very offensive. Okay, I find it very offensive. I really hate the idea. I actually don't like it at all. It makes my brain feel unhappy. I feel sick to my stomach. I got to tell you, I don't like it at all. But this is the best we have right now. I think it's wrong, but I, just, I can't believe it. But this is a point with infinite density. I have a big problem with that. Zero dimension. I have a big problem with that. I don't see how it can exist. I don't understand it. Anyways, whatever. It's really small. Even if it's just really small, that could be okay. If we get down to something called a Planck length, and that's all it could be, then I'm okay. Suddenly I'm okay. It might be that the universe doesn't allow you to get smaller than a certain distance called the Planck length, and now I'm happy. 
suddenly I'm happy. It's just the zero that I have a big problem. Anyway, <clears throat> when you're near a black hole, the force of gravity is very strong, right? And there is a place, uh, so the idea is that uh, when you try to get away from something, remember the idea of the escape velocity? How fast do you have to go to get off of the Earth? How fast do you have to go to get off of the moon? Is it greater, is it harder to get off the moon or off of the Earth? Which one's harder to get off of? The Earth. It's much higher gravitational field. So you don't have to go as fast on the moon as you do on Earth to get away from it. This is called the escape velocity. Well, the same idea could be asked about the black hole. And a black hole, how fast does it take to get away from it? Well, the closer you get, the faster you have to go to get away from it because the gravity is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. So there is a, a mathematical line that we draw. It's not a real boundary. It's not a hard boundary. It's a mathematical idea. And we call that you know, the, the event horizon. Okay, what is that? It's a theoretical place where, in order to escape, right, the escape velocity is a very special thing. It's the speed of light. So we're going to be studying in just a moment that nothing can go faster than light. So nothing, not even light, can escape from the black hole if you go any closer than this. So this edge is not hard. It's just a mathematical thing. It's kind of like the size of the black hole, right? Because once you get in here, you can't get out. Okay? So this is kind of like the size of the black hole. And so it has another name. It's called... RS, I think I have it up there. No, I don't. What am I doing? Okay, it's called the short shield radius. Okay, I don't know if you have to know that. Yeah. The Schwartz shield radius. I don't know if you have to know that. Maybe you don't know. I forgot. I think, I think they mentioned their names. Okay, so it's the, like the, the edge of the black hole. But it's not a hard edge, it's just mathematical. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think I should talk about, well, why don't I talk about a couple more things with black holes real quick, okay? So when you, uh, when you come close to a black hole, one of the ideas is that you, you have a body, right? You have your head, you have your feet. What happens, I'm just going to draw a little rectangle here to represent your body, right? Let's put your feet down here, right? Your feet, you're going to go feet first, right? Here's your head, right? What happens when you're near this really powerful gravitational field, right? Or in this powerful, ah, very good. There is a tidal force. Remember what tidal force means? It's the stretching force because the force of gravity is not the same on your feet as it is on your head. Which one's stronger? A little bit stronger. The feet, because you're closer. A little bit closer, a little bit further. So what does a black hole do to you? It stretches you, right? And then you'll die. But anyways, right? So you're going to die. Black holes kill you. But we have a funny little name. We think, we, we know, in fact, that the forces of the black hole are so profound. The tidal forces of a black hole will take the body and stretch it into a skinny little strand of matter. And so to be funny, physicists have invented a name for this. And we call it spaghettification. Spaghettified. You've been spaghettified. You've been stretched into a strand of spaghetti by the tidal forces. Okay, so that's a real term. It's a technical term. And it's right up here somewhere. No, it's not. It's not there. What the heck? I think I have it later or something. I have it somewhere. Anyway, it's not there. Okay, I don't see it. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. And then I'm going to tell you a couple more things that we're going to come back to. Is there spaghettification? Okay. I just didn't put it on the terms, but you know the, the idea. Okay. Uh, the last thing that, uh, two things, two more things. Okay. So I probably have to explain it, but let me just tell you what happens, right? So if you're on a, if you're an, if you're watching, sorry, you're watching an astronaut fall into a black hole. You're going to observe a couple of phenomena, a couple of things that you have to be aware of. 
And the reason why this is happening is because of the profound gravitational field, right? The strength of gravity is making this effect happen. And we call that the general theory of relativity. Okay, it's going to be, I'll, I'll come back and tell you these two theories real quick, but this one is because of the big gravitational field. So it's called the, gravi the general theory of relativity. The other one is known as the special theory of relativity, but that's different. This is the general theory of relativity because of the gravitational field. So you're watching this astronaut from, from out here. Let's put you somewhere, somewhere out here, right? You're just watching. You're safe. You're on a space station far away, right? And you're watching it, watching this happen. So the astronaut is going to have a clock, right? And the astronaut is going to be shining a laser at you just so you can communicate with each other. Okay, is that good? So the astronaut's gonna shine his laser at you, or her, her laser at you, and you're gonna watch the clock. Maybe that's what they'll do. They'll, they'll click it every second, right? They'll click it. So this is a little timekeeper, right? Okay, so there's two things that you're gonna notice happen. Number one, your clock and the clock over here are not gonna work in the same way. They're not. This clock is going to tick slower. You're going to see this clock slowing down. It's called time dilation. Time dilation. Just like when your pupils get dilated, that means they're getting bigger. We see this clock second stretched out. Less time passes here, more time passes here, right? So when we see this, let's say this blink of the laser, right, every second, we're going to see the time seem to stretch out. And instead of one second, it looks like two or three or five seconds to us, right? So it's supposed to be every second. And the astronaut, by the way, is pressing it every second according to their clock. But we will not see that. So when clocks are inside of this gravitational field, they slow down. The closer they get, the stronger the gravitational field, the slower the clock will appear to tick. Deeper in the gravitational field, stronger gravitational field, slower the clock will tick. So that's effect number one, time dilation. The second effect is called gravitational redshift. The color of the laser changes as we look at it. The deeper the astronaut falls, what happens to the color? The more it will be red shifted. We'll see the color changing and becoming more lower frequency, red shift, right? So let's say it started as a violet laser, right? We would see it as he falls towards the black hole or she falls towards the black hole, it would change to indigo and change to blue, and then green. I'm doing it backwards. Uh, it was violet, right? Violet, oh, yeah. indigo, blue, green, yellow, orange, and finally red. And then we wouldn't see it because it would be infrared, right? Does that make sense? The further into the black hole they fall, or towards the black hole they fall, the greater the redshift will be. Okay, those are the two major effects, okay? So we got that. All right. So I told you a little bit, and now maybe I could go back and fill in the details here that you really are supposed to understand. Okay. I don't know how I'm going to get all this done tomorrow either. It's too much material. Luckily, I have Monday morning a little too. Huh? I have Monday morning a little too. Huh? Okay. So <clears throat> I think I have to tell you, teach you in a way, because you've never seen this stuff before. But there are two theories of relativity. They're both made by Albert Einstein, right? So that's confusing, but you have to be able to keep them straight. One is known as the special theory of relativity, and that is about things moving fast. When they're moving really fast, things that move really fast near the speed of light, then this becomes the important theory to talk about what happens to them. And we will learn that time is not absolute. This is another problem. The clocks, they're not going to tick the same, right? And then um, 
The other theory is known as the general theory of relativity. That's when you are near in a gravitational field, when you're in a gravitational, when there's masses involved. The more mass, the bigger the effect will be. And it comes from the curvature of space-time. That's the reason for it. Okay, so I think, let me just go ahead and start talking about these two theories. Okay, so number one is a special theory of relativity. So, a special theory of relativity. Oh, man, I'm going to do all of this tomorrow, but, you know, there you go. Right? Let's talk about it. Okay. Special theory of relativity. So, Einstein, uh, we think, we don't know for sure, but there's a story that Einstein came up with this question. He asked this question. He asked the question that if I were in my room looking in the mirror and the room was traveling at the speed of light, would I be able to see my reflection in the mirror? If I'm in a room, but the room is traveling at the speed of light, will I be able to look into the mirror and see my reflection? That was his question. And so the answer is yes or no. <laughs> Gotta be one or the other, right? Gotta be yes or no, right? So he decided that the right answer is, and it is the right answer, it's totally the right answer. The right answer is, sure thing. If you're in a room that's moving with a constant speed, you can't tell that you're moving. There's no sensation. You can be in a plane going 500 miles an hour and you feel like you're standing still. You can feel the same, right? So number one, Einstein said, the laws of physics are the same for all reference frames, inertial reference frames, but reference frames. He said that if you would see your reflection when you're standing still, then you should see your reflection when you're moving. Doesn't matter, right? The laws of physics are the same. So this is called postulate one, right? Number one, these are the assumptions that you make. These are the postulates, postulates, uh, I think that's also later in the study guide, special relativity, abbreviating it SR. The postulates of special relativity. Number one, the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. So what's an inertial reference frame? It's when you're moving with a constant velocity relative to somebody else. So you and I are all in the same reference frame. We're in the classroom reference frame. We will agree on what we see. You and I will all see basically the same. I mean, slightly different because of our perspective. But if we do an experiment, we will all agree on what happened. There's no disagreement because we're all in the same reference frame. But if you're in a different reference frame, you may not see the same thing, but the physics will still work. So the cool thing is that I can take keys and throw them up in my hand and they land in my hand, right? Physics works, right? I could be in a car or a plane moving and I could do the same thing and it would still work, right? You might've tried this before. It works, it's amazing. They go right back into your hand, right? Don't be driving at the same time, by the way. Just, but you're a passenger, you could do this experiment. So number one, he said the laws of physics are the same. And then number two, this is the one that's a little stranger, but it turns out that he assumed, let's just try it. Let's see if this is right. And there was some clue beforehand that it was probably the case. But he said that all observers measure the same speed for light. Light always has the same speed for everyone who sees it. It doesn't change speed. The speed of light is a constant, is the same for all observers. So that's number two, the speed of light is the same for all observers. Okay. That means whether you make the light or you see the light, it doesn't matter. You're always gonna measure the speed of light as the same thing. And that turns out to be the one that causes us some problems. Well, not problems, it just reveals the nature of reality in a way that you never knew. Okay. So it turns out there's a very simple experiment that we could do, or 
it's not even the real experiment, it's called the Gen Duncan experiment. And I'm going to jump to um, a website that we have called um, SBCC Flash. And there's a little animation I'd like to show you, which is right here. So we're going to make a clock from a, um, a laser or a light and a pair of fingers. So what happens is that the light is going to leave from here, it's going to bounce off of the mirror and come back and hit a detector here. And that would be one tick of the clock. And so the, the time that you measure in the place where this experiment is taking place is called the proper time. What we're going to do is take this whole experiment and put it on a moving car or a rocket or a, a train or something. And we're going to watch it happen again. And you want to notice that because the mirror is moving, the light doesn't move on a vertical path anymore. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to hit the mirror. So if you're watching this train go past where they're doing the experiment, the light doesn't go vertically up and vertically down it moves along a diagonal line. Does that make sense? You see it moving because the mirror has to move, right? So it goes up, it hits the mirror, and it bounces. It does bounce, so it has to hit the mirror, but it has to move along a diagonal path, right? So something very interesting, right? If you compare the two of them, you will find out that because one of them makes a longer path, you see the path, longer path. Which one's right? They're both right, right? It's from different points of view, from different longer path. Which one's right? They're both right, right? It's from different points of view, from different inertial reference frames. So one of them is in on the car, on the uh, on the train, where the experiment is being performed, and they see the light going up and going down. Travels only up and then back down. But if you watch the whole train go past you, then you see this, right? From your point of view, standing on the side of the track, you see the light traveling a greater distance. It travels a greater distance. But according to Einstein, the speed of light is the same. What does it mean if you travel a greater distance? How is it possible to go further? More time passed. You don't have the same conception of time. Time is not the same for you. Who has more time? Who will spend more time during this experiment? The people watching it go past, they see this diagonal movement. So when you stand here, actually instead of trains, we're gonna use rockets from now on because rockets go fast, right? And you need to go fast to really see this effect. So we're going to have a rocket where the experiment is being performed. And then the rocket is going to fly past the Earth. And we're going to watch the rocket go by. And what happens is more time passes for us on Earth than for the people who are on the rocket. The clocks don't tick the same way. Time is relative. So who spends more time? The people watching the moving rocket will spend more time. And it turns out that there is one factor to explain this. So we're not doing a lot of math, right? We can't do a lot of moving rocket will spend more time. And it turns out that there is one factor to explain this. So we're not doing a lot of math, right? We can't do a lot of math in this class. But I do have to tell you that all of the math class, but I do have to tell you that all of the math is contained in a single factor. And that single factor has a name that I want to share with you. So the name of this factor is called the Lorentz factor. Okay? And you don't have to know how to do anything that I'm about to do. You only have to know a basic idea. So there's called the Lorentz factor. 
it turns out you can do the math. It's not even that hard. We could do it. It's just algebra. The Pythagorean theorem. If you could do the Pythagorean theorem, I could probably make it for you, but anyway, we're not going to do it. This Lorentz factor has the Greek letter C or gamma. If you could do the Pythagorean theorem, I could probably make it for you, but anyway, we're not going to do it. This Lorentz factor has the Greek letter C or gamma. Gamma is the Lorentz factor. Gamma is this funny little formula. Again, we're not going to use it. I just want to show it to you so you can understand how it works. One over the square root of one minus b squared over c squared. So this is called the Lorentz factor. So what is v? V is the speed of the rocket. V is the speed of the rocket. Okay? So when we measure the speed of the rocket in this class, we're going to write things like this. V equals point, let's put point 0.5 C. What does this mean? The speed of the rocket is one half the speed of light. 0.5 C, one half the speed of light. That's fast, isn't it? Right? But how do you use this formula? You could use this formula if you were in a class that was more advanced. We would actually use it. Okay, we don't do that. But I'm just trying to show you you could use this to this. You go one divided by the square root of one minus. Well, when you put this in, the C gets squared and the 0.5 gets squared. The C squared is canceled. And you get 1 minus 0.5 squared. I mean, it's so around what it is. But what is it going to be? More or less than 1 on the bottom? You're subtracting. So it's going to be less than 1. So when you divide 1 by a number less than 1, what do you get? You get something bigger than 1, right? The Lorentz factor is a number that can be as small as 1 and as big as anything. Right? So it turns out it can go very, very big. So when you're, let's try this one. I'm going to, this is a really simple calculation. What if your speed is zero? That's an easy one. When your speed is zero, you put one minus zero, what do you get? One, and one over one is one. So when speed is zero, gamma is one. When you're not moving, or when it's not moving, gamma is one. So now I'm going to write down the, the formula for something called time dilation. Okay, time dilation. The time that is measured by the people on the side of the road watching the rocket go by, the people on Earth, is gamma times the time measured by the people on the rocket, called the proper time. That's the proper time. The proper time is the time measured by the people where the experiment is, is actually located. So the people on the rocket measure this, the people on Earth measure this, gamma times as much. So the interesting thing is, um, there's a story called the twin paradox, where you take a pair of twin people, they were born at exactly the same time, right? Well, you know, within a few minutes of each other, right? And they're, they're born together, and you put one of them on a rocket, and you send them away right, really fast. Right? So you take, take this one, and you put them on a rocket, there you go. Okay. You're going to go really fast. You're going to go, uh, I don't know, really fast. 0. 0.999, I don't know, really, really fast. Really close to the speed of light. In fact, let me go ahead and tell you the value of gamma because we don't do that in this class. Suppose that the gamma was 100. That's a real number, right? It's gamma to be 100. Okay. <clears throat> so what's going to happen is the, the ship is going to go out. And then turn around and come back. And the time measured by the person on the ship is going to be one year. Right? But what happens because of the effects of special relativity? How much older is the twin on Earth? So it took one year for the twin on the rocket. They, they are one year older. Right? They were 21. Now they're 22. How old is the twin who's left on Earth? 120, they're dead. Okay. They're gone. They died. Bye. Right. So in for the person on Earth, the time that passed 
was a hundred times one year. A hundred years past. Yeah. Would you feel the age difference? Like, I mean, would you feel the age difference, or would you feel like you well? They're standing. They're off. standing next to the earth. They're standing together again, and one's in the ground and dead. So, so you it's real. This is so real. I know you don't believe me, but it's real. I'm about to show you another example because it's on the list of things you're supposed to know. Okay, so I, it's unbelievable but true. Okay, I'm going to show you a little video clip of experiments that were performed. We've shown this. Actually, I, I the most convincing thing, by the way, you ever heard of GPS? Just kidding. GPS. When they first created the GPS system, launched the GPS system, the the engineers were skeptical that they needed to worry about relativity at all. In fact, the engineer said, we don't think we will need relativity at all. Yeah. So they launched it without using any relativity at all. And in less than a day, it didn't work anymore. They launched a satellite, right? And now it doesn't work anymore. That was a waste, but they weren't stupid. They took the advice of the theoretical people and they had programmed in a little switch that they could turn on remotely to allow calculations to be done with special and general relativity. And they turned it on and that is required to make a GPS work properly. You can't ignore special and general relativity when doing a GPS network. It can't be ignored. Okay, so there's a lot more stuff here. Let's see. How do I get out of this? Okay. All right. So let's talk about. Um, so we talked about the. Uh, what did we talk about? We talked about time dilation. Relative velocity is the idea that there's a velocity between the two reference frames, and that's the V that shows up in that formula. So there's time dilation, and then it turns out there's another effect that's also kind of interesting, and that is called length contraction. Length contraction. So let me show you that. What that means is that the people in the rocket actually see something really interesting. On Earth, we might say, hey, let's go visit that other star, right? Hey, let's go visit that star over here. On Earth, because one's doing the measurement, we would measure the length to be four, let's put four light years, right? It's about four light years. Okay? Four light years. Do the people on the rocket see the same thing? And the answer is not at all. They see the length getting shorter as a result of this contraction. So the people on the rocket now are going to see the distance being much smaller. Oh, sorry, length, L. It's going to see, they're going to see the proper length, this time divided by gamma. And so they don't see the distance as four light years. It's four divided by 100. It's 0 0.04 in our example, right? It's a lot closer to us as a result of relativity. Okay, and that's the second one. And then the third effect comes from something that Einstein cheated. He didn't know. He added this factor later, and we've been using it, but we didn't know that, in fact, Einstein put this in by accident. He didn't do it correctly. He just thought it was more beautiful, and he was right. It is more beautiful, but it was almost luck that he did this. The third effect is something called the rest mass. The rest mass we put, uh, you can put proper mass or something like that, is the mass of an object where you are, right? It's called the rest mass. And it turns out that the, uh, that formula that you guys know, V e is equal to mc squared. That is the rest energy. You put a little P here, proper, e, the rest energy. What happens when the particle goes fast? It turns out that this formula changes, and the energy of a particle that's moving very fast is E equals gamma times mp squared, mc squared. 
Now, this is Einstein's uh, interesting equation. He added this term without even understanding it. He said, I like this. And in order to get this, he had to assume that at rest, things had energy. This is the energy that we've been talking about, E equals mc squared. It was an accident. And he was right. It was good. It was a good accident. But I want you to look up here and see. Do you see the, the difference between these equations? What is it? Just the gamma, right? So here's the deal. The mass of a particle appears to get bigger the faster it goes. It appears to get bigger. It acts like a bigger mass. The mass of an object is gamma times its rest mass. So the faster you go, the more mass effectively it seems to have, which kind of makes sense if you remember that E energy equals mc squared. So if you have more energy, you got to have more mass. Okay, so if you think about that. So those are those are some of the cool uh, ideas there. All right, so here's a, a, a final little story that we're going to talk about. The muon and cosmic rays go together. What is a cosmic ray? A cosmic ray is a high energy particle that collides, it's a high energy particle coming from another galaxy, probably, actually, probably from another galaxy. But it could from maybe from stars, but maybe from another, you know, there's this high energy particle moving near the speed of light. And what happens is they hit the atmosphere of the Earth and they slow down really fast, right? And that means they give up their energy very, very quickly. What will happen is often this cosmic ray will produce a particle called a muon. Now, do you remember that word muon from the other day? I showed you a picture of quarks and then the electrons and the neutrinos. And there were three special particles, the electron, the muon, and the tau particle were kind of special. And there were three different neutrinos, one for each of those particles. Now the muon is a kind of a particle. It can't be divided into other parts, right? It's a single particle. These muons are created from the energy that is released by the cosmic rays in the upper atmosphere. Okay? So far so good? They're made up there. Now, if you take one of these muons in the laboratory, they're unstable. They're unstable. What's that mean? They're going to decay. They last for a few milliseconds, I think. Maybe not even that. It might be millions of a second, microseconds. I don't know, whatever. Small, small time. Right? They only live for a little tiny time in the laboratory reference frame. So if you make them in the laboratory and you hold it in your hand, you're like, it's gone, right? Really, really fast. But they're moving really fast, actually near the speed of light when they're created, it turns out. And it turns out that if you calculate how far they should go through the atmosphere, if they only live the length of time that they do in the laboratory reference frame, they would only get like a third of the way through the atmosphere before they decay. So maybe a few made it down to the surface, but basically not very many. On the other hand, when you measure muons, you find out lots of them make it down to the surface. How can that be? How can it be that the muons make it all the way to the surface? Because they're moving really fast. They're like on their rockets, right? They're little tiny rockets. And so even though they only live a short time in their reference frame, from our point of view on Earth, because they're moving so fast, they live longer long enough to make it all the way down to the surface. And when you calculate how many should make it to the surface, it works perfectly. Special relativity predicts the right number of muons at the surface. So they shouldn't live, but because of time dilation, they live long enough to make it all the way down to the surface and we measure them. And these are actually being measured all the time on the surface of the Earth. Okay, so cosmic rays gave us muons, which make it down to the surface of the Earth. Gravitational lensing, is the idea that light is bent by gravity. You have larger objects like stars um, or actually even the sun, the light from, from other stars, further distant stars, when it comes near the sun is going to be bent. And so um, actually Einstein predicted this uh, in 1915. And in 1918, there was a very special event, a, suit, a total eclipse. But it's not visible uh, for most of the world, and a team of scientists went to go photograph the special, uh, special event, this total eclipse. 
And what they did was really beautiful. They took a picture of the stars during the total solar eclipse. So you can't see stars during the day normally, but during a total solar eclipse, the sun is blocked. And in principle, you should be, I actually tried and I failed. I could not see the stars. It's one of the list of things that I'm supposed to try to do in my life. See stars during total, I haven't done it yet. I tried and I couldn't see them. So you need a better situation somehow, maybe a more, uh, a better solar eclipse or something, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I need to use a camera, I don't know, I'm not sure. But I wanna see it, I still haven't seen it. But they used the camera, took a picture of the stars during a solar, total solar eclipse. And they found something amazing, right? They found that when, the, when they took the picture, they took the picture two times, one before the solar eclipse, and then another after the solar eclipse. So here's the sun. I'm oh, sorry. Here's here's the stars. There's stars. Right? There's a few stars. So this is the picture before the solar eclipse. They took a picture of that region of the sky. And then during the solar eclipse, they took the picture. Remember that this is being blocked out by the light of the moon. And the stars were there. They were a little bit closer. I'm, I'm trying to just quickly teach you what's going on, but they were shifted. It's like they got pulled in a little bit, and the mass of the sun actually changed the direction of the light just slightly to make them look like coming from a different location. So the presence of the sun shifted them by a small amount, which was exactly because of the force of gravity from the sun. This is called gravitational lensing. So the idea is if a, if a beam of light goes past the star, it can be bent by that star. Gravitational lensing. It acts like a magnifying glass, maybe. Right? And the, the crazy thing is uh, that we've seen this in much more beautiful ways. There's something called an Einstein ring. I'll just show you this. Okay. This is an Einstein ring. This is a picture. In the front, you have a galaxy. And behind it is another galaxy that should be hidden. You shouldn't be able to see it. It's behind the first galaxy. But the light from that distant galaxy is going in every direction. And some of it is close enough to the front galaxy that it gets bent around every edge, right? And shows you this ring for that galaxy. You're looking at the light coming from all these different directions and being focused towards the Earth just like a lens would, right? So gravitational lensing, right? So anyways, a mass acts like a, a lens and can focus light or change the direction of light. That's called gravitational lensing. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Oh, there's words you already Oh, speaking of patient, that'll work. I think I might have talked about a lot of this okay. already. Amy, you recognize me? Okay, so the event horizon I talked about, and there's the word Schwarzschild radius, okay? So, what is that? That was the distance at which the escape velocity is the speed of light. Tidal forces. The stretching forces of gravity, because you're a little bit closer, a little bit further, they stretch you out, so they lead to spaghettification. Gravitational redshift, they talked about that. That's actually one of the effects of general relativity. And then a supermassive black hole is a black hole with a very large mass. So I'm gonna show you tomorrow, but why don't I show you now? Okay. It is, let's see it again, I guess. Uh, at the center of the Milky Way galaxy is a supermassive black hole. It is four million times the mass of the sun. Four million times the mass of the sun. And how do we know that it's there? Well, it's black, isn't it? It turns out black holes are not very black most of the time. When a black hole is pulling matter into it, that matter will orbit for a little while in an area called the accretion disk. Remember that word? Accretion disk. So when the matter is in that accretion disk, it actually is being bombarded from other matter and it's very hot, like hot enough to emit what color of light? Anybody wanna guess? X-rays. So when we started looking using X-ray cameras, we discovered there's black holes everywhere. 
they're all over the place. And um, the one in the middle of the Milky Way doesn't have an accretion disk. So how can we even know that it's there? And the answer is we've been watching what it does to stars in the neighborhood. And the stars in the neighborhood are actually um, getting affected. So let's see. Supermassive black hole. Milky Way. Super Okay, so these are stars near the center of the Milky Way, and they're orbiting around some unseen object. We can't see it. There's nothing there. But we know the masses of the stars, and from their orbits, we can actually calculate the mass of that unseen object, right? So the way that we know that it's there is because of its gravitational influence on stars that are nearby. All right, so this is actually, we're getting into the future, we're predicting where it's going to be, but then we can compare it with prediction. Now what's really cool is there's a big cloud of gas headed for the Milky Way right now. What's going to happen when the Milky Way eats it up? It's going to have an accretion disk for a little while, which means it will start to grow and we'll actually see the edge of that black hole. Okay? There's something else that's pretty cool. We've been watching, um, scientists have been watching, stars that get too close to a black hole are ripped into shreds. And it's called, it's a brand new thing. It's only been seen a few times, like about five times, I think, about 10 to 15 times. This is no more than 12. I think 15 is the right number right now. But a few, about 15 times, we've seen stars ripped apart by black hole and shining with light. It's called a tidal disruptive event. I think that's, you don't need to worry about that. It's good enough. Okay, I'm going to stop in just a couple minutes because it's way over. And then um, I'm almost done by the time preview. I have to go teach my class today. Where do you have to be? Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, state the two postulates of special relativity. What are they? Physics is the same for all observers, and the speed of light is a constant. Describe the twin paradox, right? So, what's the twin paradox? And actually, I didn't tell you the paradox part, did I? I gotta tell you the paradox. Okay, so um, are you moving or am I moving right now? I'm neither one of us. Okay, now how about this? Are you moving or am I moving? Okay, from your point of view, I'm moving, but guess what? From my point of view, you are moving. Oops, who's right? Yeah. We're both right. Okay. So you know this whole story I told you about the twin getting on the rocket and going away for a while? Who's moving? The earth or the rocket? Who's moving? According to the rocket, who's moving? The earth is moving, right? So shouldn't it be that the earth is the one that's moving, right? They should age less. So it's a paradox, right? Who is moving? But the answer is only one person is moving. What happens when you start to move? What do you feel? Remember what it's called when you start to move? You're not moving, then you start moving. You accelerate. So do you feel your acceleration? Yes, you can feel your, you can't feel your speed, but you can feel your acceleration. So one of the twins experiences an acceleration 
they're the twin that's moving. And in the end, they're the twin that ages less. Okay, so it's not a paradox. We can actually explain it. And if you did this experiment, you would find out that the one that was moving ages less than the one that stays behind. Okay, so that's the, that's the two things. Uh, why is the event horizon the edge of the black hole? Why is that true? Uh, I didn't tell you something. Okay, you've got to look at this gamma factor here. Take a look at this gamma factor. What happens if we're to put in the speed of light right here? C for V. What would happen? This would be one. What's one minus one? Zero. What would gamma be? Infinity. So there's a problem. If you take a piece of matter and try to speed it up to the speed of light, remember I told you the mass gets bigger and bigger effectively? Well, that means it's harder and harder to make it move. The energy of that particle is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? If you went to C, then this would be infinity. We don't like infinity in physics because that would mean that the object has infinite energy. The whole universe doesn't have infinite energy. It has some amount of energy. And so we don't like that. So what we say is that nothing that has mass can travel at the speed of light. Nothing. But you can get very, very close. So the, the thing that I would, I would you know, happy to tell you is that we've gotten really, really close to the speed of light. 0.9999951. The speed of light is what they use for the highest energy uh, process at CERN, which is in Switzerland. And so there are particles that are moving that fast, nearly the speed of light, so, but they can't go the speed of light. Well, and I already went through this. And so the two effects for general relativity, I'm just going to try to finish real quickly, are time dilation, again, and uh, gravitational redshift. Gravitational redshift. Okay, so if somebody's flashing the laser, I went through this with you, right? What would happen to the flash? <clears throat> the flashes, as they felt closer, there would be bigger and bigger times between the flashes, and the color would change too. It would shift towards a lower frequency, gravitational redshift. And how do we know that there's a supermassive black hole? I just showed you the video, right? The stars are orbiting something that's invisible, it's gotta be there. And then last, how do we see most black holes? We don't see the holes, but what do we see? The accretion disk. When matter is falling in, it heats up and shines with X-ray light while it's still falling in. And so for that little moment when the accretion disk is there, then we can see the black hole. Once the accretion disk is gone, they're invisible. We can't see them. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. I'm sorry it's a little bit extra here. You guys, uh, we're going to cover this tomorrow and Monday probably. I don't think I'm going to finish tomorrow. Seems like too much material. Okay, hopefully that helps. Wait, so uh, light doesn't have mass, right? Light does not so have mass. Because <laughs> gravity affects things even without mass. I'm going to explain it tomorrow to you, but it's called the equivalence principle. Einstein said that if, if, if uh, he said that you can't tell the difference between a gravitational field and an accelerating frame of reference, you can't tell the difference. There is no difference. If you're accelerating, it feels like a gravitational field. Because of that, light must be affected by gravity because it's also affected in an accelerating reference frame. So I promise tomorrow I'll help make this a little bit clearer. But it's pretty strange, right? Yeah, yeah gravity and uh, Newton's law was wrong. It's not right. That's the important idea. It's not. It gives you pretty good results, though, doesn't it? But Einstein said... That whole thing that we call gravity is not really happening. It's the perception because time and space are interwoven with each other. When space gets curved, our perception of motion appears to change. That object which you see orbiting the earth is not moving at all. The standing, I know, I'm sorry. I wish it didn't have to be so ugly, but it's weird, isn't it? It's standing still, but from our point of view, it appears to be orbiting, but it is standing still. I know. Weird. Okay. See you guys tomorrow. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I missed the last What was that? I missed the last day. It's my first time in the summer class, so it doesn't affect anything. <laughs>